roughly every one of the top 40 records being played on every radio station in the United States is a communication to the children to take a trip, to cop out, to groove. The psychedelic jackets on the record albums have their own hidden we don't want you to smoke genetically modified ganja. We want you to smoke the real thing. We want you to smoke the natural herb. Some call it marijuana. Some call it sense media. Some call it lamb's bread. And some people call it ganja. Welcome to another edition of the Adam Dunn Show. Uh, I'm your host, <laughs> Adam Dunn. And last week I didn't fucking do it, didn't do a dab at the beginning of the show. I was like completely lost. Totally fucked me up <laughs> by not doing a dab. Exactly. Yeah, so, it was still a good show though. It was a good show, mm-hmm. but it was hard on the beginning. I was like, wait a minute. I'm on the back foot right out of the gate. <laughs> um, we're going to have uh, calling in real soon, in about 20 minutes or so. We're going to have Sonny Chiba calling in. And then a little later in the show, we're going to have Snow High calling in, which we had a lot of requests for people. Wanted to talk more with him. And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe Mr. Bean will call in. You know, stranger things have happened, right? Right. Don't plan on it, though. If you plan on it, he'll fall asleep <laughs> and forget about the show. So we never plan on it anymore. Um, <clears throat> so, how was your week? Good. Uh, yeah, nothing to report. No, no nuclear wars yet? No nuclear wars yet. <laughs> it's always good when there's not a nuclear... It's basically, the, that, that's going to be a good week. Right. It's nice that you can keep up with it on Twitter. And everything, you know. I don't have Twitter. <laughs> I've actually thought about getting it, but then I was like, I'm not going to get it just for him because that's right. fucking, that's really bad. Yeah, I've had it for a while now, so uh, it's, I don't really use it much anymore. But it's uh, well, that's it's, where it's going to be announced first. So you right. know, oh yeah, absolutely. you know, you want to be front line on that. Yep. So yeah, I went to uh, to uh, Portland last week. That was pretty cool. Nice. How'd that go for the Indo Expo? And it went really well. It was a good show. The uh, it's always nice when the shows. Uh, progress at the right rate mm-hmm. don't move too fast but i mean that one literally started in like a restaurant or something in the background you know so it's cool to see how it it did grow pretty fast but at the same time got a cool head on its shoulders it seems like as far as the show goes and they definitely with some some sales being done which is really the key to a good show is happy vendors Absolutely. equals a good show so if i walk around the first thing i'll do is ask all my friends who are vending how it's going, and if they all seem like they're pretty positive, then it's usually a good show. Right. And this was that. Exactly. Awesome. This, was ex- this was like textbook version. Hey, how's it going? Great. Oh, it's so good. People, because the thing about it, too, is it's, um, you know, you're in the Northwest, which has a, you know, deep history of cannabis. It's not like anything's new there as far as, like, not like people don't know it, but it's also been very... Uh, doing it his own way, you know what I mean, for this whole mm-hmm. time, and I think, like, everywhere, and uh, to see a little more international mix of things, and just this, it's kind of like the stabilization of the industry, you know, people are doing their thing their own way, and some people are doing it right, some people are doing it wrong, Sure. but uh, after, you know, another couple more years, we'll have that shit dialed in. So, uh, yeah, interestingly enough, here's a Go straight to a rant, right? I'm gonna go straight yeah. to a rant. No, you tell me about some crazy stuff. So, uh, landing into Portland, you know, first thing you do, of course, go and check all your messages on your fucking messenger and on your fucking <laughs> thing. So you're like, I'm looking, and I see that two is like two and uh, James from Seeds Are Now both are posting about this guy uh, ripping our seeds off. Mm-hmm. Wasn't well, actually any of mine. Luckily, there's only one. There's a bubblegum cross, but. But I mean, like, straight ripping off TSK, straight ripping off OD Diesel's uh, Natural Good Homegrown Wonders, straight ripping off Sunny, straight ripping off, like, descriptions, wow, everything, really? just cut and paste. And, you know, 20 bucks a pack and just classic hack job, you know? Right. So, wow. So I see this and I was like, okay, well, this, this guy's a jackass, right? So I post, text to him private message and just told them basically to stop poking the fucking hive if you don't have a clue what you're doing because you're right. stepping in t- into everybody's thing and you're fucking and yeah he had um crockett farms i mean wow you know it wasn't like yeah it wasn't across the board he basically yeah, like no, took a seeds here now catalog and just crazy. cut and pasted it so does he have his own website then is, is that what's going on or? um yeah there's a website it's mm-hmm. i mean and that was the other thing too when you looked at it you were like 
wow. These all have pow- everything has powdery mildew mostly, and if it's not a ripped off photo, a lot of them are like, uh, "Hey, wait a minute, that's a photo directly from the catalog." Okay, so that's not. Right. But then he had a couple of his own personal photos, and they were like, uh, "Fucking jacked." I mean, the plants looked like they had either russet mites or they definitely had powdery mildew. They were definitely mildew infested, that's for sure. But then beyond that, you know, would like to get those multi symptoms going on. <clears throat> looked terrible. Yeah. Uh, anyway, hippie crack seeds. If you really want to get bad quality seeds. <laughs> you need to order them from those guys. Um, but yeah, and he was a complete jackass. He basically was racist. You know, he was calling, he basically had an, like one of James's friends is a, who's a, a chef and makes really good edibles and stuff. And he, he contacted the guy just because he saw what was going on and didn't even really get into anything. And all of a sudden this guy's coming back like, you white cracker ass motherfucker. Duh, duh, duh. And this guy's an Asian dude. <laughs> so this guy's like, okay. You wow. obviously don't know who you're talking to. You didn't even care to look at who you were, you know, lashing out at. But then, yeah, classic example of another guy who thinks, like, he's th- thought of this great new idea. And I actually see a big trend. It's like a trend, which is kind of like, it's kind of sad, but it's like, a, if you notice, every other person has got an auction going on now, too. Yeah. I'm like, what? when did it become legal to now auction seats. Is that just a typical thing? You can just do that, I guess. I guess everybody can just auction seats. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I can see when you're doing it for a charity, it makes sense. You're doing it for somebody, for a cause. But when you're straight up just selling seats, but it's in an auction setting, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's a very, uh, I mean, seeds are all like, sure, there's a real setup. They actually paid for the back line, making it all official. You know what I mean? If you, if you uh, when you go on their thing, if you're actually like, you know, you're, you're bidding on it, your bid holds. I mean, it's not like right. some guy pick a number from one to a hundred. Uh, Jimmy Joe <laughs> wins another pack. Whoa! I threw in a free pack or whatever. I don't. Know. This seems a bit lame. Like right. I'm definitely seeing a, a huge trend where it's like unverified, and you know, of course, as we all know, there could be gems in all these things for sure. Sure. And right. not to belittle anybody's attempt at the, getting into the industry, but the reality is it's also like we're getting crowded, you know what I mean? Like to the point of like, okay, so, you you know, what are these things? And and if, but, you know, I can't, like nobody can hold back because it's a, it is an industry where it's always been, you know, an underground fucking piratey industry to begin with. So Mm -hmm. we already knew that, but there is getting to the point where it's kind of like, okay, well, I don't know if we really need that, you know, every other thing on my Facebook. Yeah. Rant over. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a pretty weird thing to land, uh, uh, you know, to land and then get into this, like... Well, you yeah. know, and it was also because it was, like, they were, they took a booth at the show. That's what made it even more of, like, a, oh, really? So, so you guys have a booth at the show? And it was actually just a table at the show. It wasn't <laughs> necessarily a booth, but, um, yeah, and the chick who was, who was running it, she had no clue what she was talking about. She was talking to us about that they asked Leafly if it was okay, and Leafly said, no problem. I'm like... What does that even mean? That doesn't even mean yeah, anything. No, that's like, it it's like, no, it's not how it works. <laughs> you know what I mean? Leafly is not an authority yeah. on trademark infringement. You know what I mean? Like, Speaking of trademark infringement, did you hear about the Gorilla Glue stuff? Oh, yeah. That's been going on for a while. Oh, okay. I just saw the, the story in the cannabis. Well, the best part is if you look at the names of the lawyers, uh-huh. it's done and done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> done and done have brought the case against them. From, they're, 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 they are uh, representing... The real gorilla club. Oh, right. So that's crazy. I was man. like, whoa, done and done. That's, you definitely don't want them after you. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I wonder what's going to happen with that. But it's pretty insane that, you know, I mean, because there's a lot. I mean, I, don't, I can't think of any right off the top of my head of other strain names that are like uh, probably like trademarked or something like that. But oh, there's plenty. There's so many. Yeah. There's so many because people haven't really thought too far ahead, like future proof their 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 thing, and they're like, oh, I'm going to base it all off a of Yoda, or I'm going to base it all off of some Disney character, or I'm going to base it all off. It's like, eh, you got, might run into a problem at a certain point because yeah. every single one of those things are incredibly protected. You know, people just literally like sitting around all day waiting for people to just step into their trap and <laughs> and name something after it. Even the guy that was making those. Uh, those replica um, uh, lightsaber things. You ever seen that? Where he had like lightsaber, he had like a whole thing where it was like in the same font and it was lightsaber parties or lightsaber. And they had like in the park where everyone would bring their lightsabers and they'd all be fighting in the park. But it was all, 
and he got his ass fucking reamed, of oh. course. He was doing it for years, too. He did it for a couple yeah. years, and everybody thought it was cool, and he was building his own lightsabers, and they were more durable than the one, you know, the GP ones you get, and they sure. were, like, people were really fighting with them and getting serious, <laughs> and creating leagues and all this shit, and then all of a sudden they came down and just were like, oh, by the way, this saber is, well, you know, you can't even use the word saber, you can't use the word light, you can't use okay. anything close <laughs> yeah, <right>. to it. <laughs> So, yeah, you don't want to fuck around with those corporations. I mean, sure. there's, there's some that are going to be happy when you use their name. I mean, it was just kind of funny how we did the, how, during the last with the Purple Urkel story, how it really was Urkel. You yeah, know what I mean? Right. And at the end of the day, yeah. it was like pretty much we all thought that. Right. But we weren't sure. Sure. But in the end of the day, like probably Urkel would not be in our minds in any way, shape, or form if it wasn't for fucking Purple Urkel. You know what I mean? So there's yeah. certain times where the strain might keep something relevant. Right. Where it was not relevant at all. Yeah. Yeah. And Gorilla Glue is a good example in a sense of like, well, everybody who grows weed for real is pretty much bought Gorilla Tape. And I bought, I think the fact that we yeah, we associate right. with Gorilla Glue that I, w- I would buy Gorilla Tape, even though maybe another tape might even be better. Who knows? Even though Gorilla Tape is <laughs> definitely cheaper. Yeah. We know that, 100% cheaper. So yeah, but you can look at it from both ways. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, there's definitely times where weed, like, people are lucky because all of a sudden they're, they're, they're relevant because some weed is named after whatever they're doing at that particular moment. And that's happened a bunch of times, I think. Yeah. That I, not that I can actually pull one out of my brain right, right now. Yeah, yeah. But, I was trying to think of something, too, but I can't, but I can't think of anything. I know it's happened. Right. But then there's other companies too, like for instance, all the butane companies, how, how freaked out are they right now with their sales spike? You know what I mean? It's like, so culturally, you know, whenever something hits in the cannabis world, it creates a, a bump in any business that is doing anything legal around it. You know what I mean? Right. If there's any kind of weight crossover. Just like fast food. <laughs> fast food has made so much money off of cannabis. Like they should be donating more money to legalization every day. I mean, then right. you know, you see companies like Doritos and those guys, they embrace it because they know that's a huge piece of their market. Oh yeah. You know, so in yeah. general, if you're if you're smart and you're in marketing doing any kind of large corporation stuff, probably until it gets to it's getting to the point where it's almost like, okay, unless here's you better be one or two guys in your fucking company that smoke weed or else, you know, now mm-hmm. we're coming after you. But when it comes to like computer companies, programming, all the, anything like that, mm. it's all stoners. We know that they're all stoners. So if they right. were to, like if Google started doing positive cannabis stuff, because everybody, we know that every programmer and every coder is probably high, making their fucking company what it is, you know? Right. But if they were cool, and all of a sudden Google was like a weed-friendly company, which you kind of imagine they were back in the day before everybody knew they were evil. Like now, you know, they're the, <laughs> the evilest company in the world and you definitely don't want to give them anything. But back in the day, they were like, man, they treat their people so cool and they just have such a cool attitude. And it's like, yeah, okay, that's true. But with evil, with completely evil intentions, right. based, you know, yeah, yeah, behind yeah. everything. But like, imagine if Google was like, yeah, you can smoke weed at yeah, Google. Everybody would be like, Google is the coolest company in the world. That's all it would take. It takes like one little, you know. Right. Little of course, for our part of the, part of, of the uh, our segment of the society. Right. Other people would be like, I don't want those people having my data if they're marijuana smokers. They're going to lose it. Bro. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to lose yeah. all my data, man. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Probably just as bad. Probably even worse. Probably if you really, really, really think about it, it's probably... Uh, it's probably uh, Way more damaging for your company, so just in our little world, it's beneficial. But no, you can see a lot of companies doing it though, milking it hard. When you like, especially around here with billboards and stuff, you're just like, really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Lowest common denominator. Yeah, like the the pizza roll ones and exactly yeah, all that stuff. The around 420 had a bunch of stupid ones that were outside of buses and stuff. Yep. So like, one of them said, didn't say like why 420 was invented or something stupid like that. There was one like. Yeah. Something dumb. Yeah. So let's um, uh, do a quick shout out so that when Sonny calls in in about six, seven minutes, we're done with that. All right. Uh, at the show at Indo Expo, they were there, New Millennium, right across from us. It was pretty cool. We had booths straight across from each other so we could watch each other and I could just <laughs> pass it. Every time someone asked me what I grew with, it would be like right there. and like, That was easy. Oh, awesome. So much easier than Perfect. having to explain it every time. Right. Uh, New Millennium, based out of here in Colorado with a great program. They've been working on it for 
a few years now. It hasn't. It didn't just come out overnight, um, even though a lot of people haven't heard of it yet. But the uh, yeah, they have some serious products within their line. Their Ruby Fulvic is a source with nine different sources of uh, fulvic acid. Which, if you know anything about fulvic acid, you know that that's like the the pinnacle of the top of the of the periodic table there for what we're using in this industry. And it's uh, pretty pretty cool to get nine different sources. And that product you can use independently with any other food. So if you have to dabble into New Millennium, I would suggest buying a little bit of that Ruby Fulvic and uh, using it in between your your cycles and just like anytime you feel like you want to improve the health of your plants just hit them up with that and see if that does not do the trick um, but they have the whole complete line again based on seasons so it's really cool it's really easy to kind of piece it together they also have a nutrient calculator online they have uh, you can figure out your schedules they have a couple different formulas they have a kind of a mild one mellow and then they have a, a more pro version brings in a couple other products like the green sensation from playground which is really awesome additive um and well one thing they do run all the time for most of their stuff is uh bud swell which i love mm. i get free advertisement on my show all the time just because i've been using it for so long yeah um but it makes me feel confident that they are on the same tip when we're using you know something like that product uh, alongside with the uh, with what they have you can go to new millennium com and check out all that all those nutrient calculators and all that kind of stuff. And you can also see if they have uh, located anywhere near you. If not, when you're at your local grocery shop, just bother, you know, bug them, say, what up? Get this new millennium in, man. And then mm-hmm. if you do that, I'm sure you'll get a little bit of extra bonus points from the guys who are bringing it into that shop. Um, and if you want to order online all sorts of good products, you want to go to buildasoil.com. Uh, our friend Jeremy over there has been running this company for a fair number of years now and he's just gets bigger and better and more uh, efficient and got a really good staff there too so if you ever have any questions you can call and talk to anybody you can call uh 855-877-SOIL anytime during business hours or you can go to buildasoil.com anytime in the middle of the night when you got a quick idea yeah. whatever you can check out what they got they have a very good uh back side of the uh, website too with a lot of tutorials and things and you can also uh yeah, we got to get Jeremy on the show soon. Because he can go back and listen to a bunch of our old episodes with Jeremy, uh, which we haven't had on for a while. So I'm definitely going to get him on soon. But you can listen to a lot of older shows. He's uh, broken down uh, a lot of different growing techniques and even just got in as simple as a whole show on nitrogen. That was a good one. That was the one that made the kid pass out and <laughs> couldn't even keep his eyes open. So. <laughs> yeah, I really remember that. He Those was were, sleeping through that stuff. That was yeah. a good one, yeah. So don't be like the kid. Stay <laughs> up and actually listen to the show. Absolutely. Um, yeah, buildersoil.com. Check them out. And, of course, Incredibles, Edibles, and Extracts here in Colorado and now in Nevada and California. Super consistent on their dosage, super consistent on their flavors. Um, got a good coverage of all sorts of great new flavors that we haven't even tried. A couple of new with the winter mint I haven't tried, the pistachio I have not tried. But I love that pumpkin, I know that. And I love those uh, fireberries, and I love uh, I, yeah, pretty much everything I've ever had from the avocados <laughs> are also super duper fire. Oh, I like those. Those are my favorite, actually. I think those are the those are the adult. I feel like you're an adult when you eat those. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> those and the fireberries are both like adult kind of candy, like extra. Adult. Yeah, these are all adult candies, by the way. None of these are for kids. Yeah. And they also got a bunch of gummies, six different flavors right now, and um, different consistencies. I think are they all the same? Are they all are they all the same? Let's shape? see. Yeah, gummies, fruit chews, mm-hmm. uh, licorice, mm-hmm. strawberry okay. chews, cinnamon cannabis drops, and sour gummies. Yeah, so they're a little yeah great. Those are all new lines. Cinnamon sound really fire. Mm-hmm. And then of course the extracts, uh, gold and uh, black label. Black label means that it came from their personal garden, so you know it's 100 percent fire. And then gold label, of course, it, wherever you're standing in at that particular moment, if they have good weed, then they're gonna have great extracts because doubt these guys are going to make it bad right mm-hmm. never um you can go to i love incredibles.com and check them out online you can also go to there's a store finder there unless you zoom out or zoom in really hard it's going to be hard to find your local store in your <laughs> neighborhood because it's pretty much covering the state so yep. and seats here now the guys are bringing uh the 
next two guests that we're going to have on the show. Sonny Chiba's on there is in his corral. Snow High's in the corral. I'm in the corral. We're all there because it's pretty much the best of the best in American breeders and uh, direct from breeder to you, uh, original packaging. You know, everything about it is is legit. There's none of this like, oh, we'll just pick your top three and I'll you'll get one of them, hopefully. No, you get what you order, guaranteed. And if you don't like what he grows, then you just tell him and he'll he'll replace it. You know, no problem. It's uh it's not a it's, it's worth keeping the customer happy, which is what it's about. And we're talking about seeds here, so it's like literally things can go weird, you know. We never we never you could have all males, it's possible. Things happen. Mm-hmm. We know. Um and uh yeah, you can go Oh, there we go. Mr. On time. Put him on the side. Or he can help us. Yo, Mr. Sonny Chiba. On, what are you on time or something? Oh yeah. I'm on, on, on time, man. <laughs> I guess so. Um so we're just doing the seeds here now, uh plug, so you can feel free to join in anytime and just mumble seeds here now or do whatever you want. But uh I was just telling everybody how awesome their customer service is and the fact that they have original packaging and they have the real breeders and they're not doing any kind of top three choices and any of that kind of crap that people have had to deal with for so long when ordering seeds your experiences have been great right of course yeah absolutely and uh there aren't many companies out there who uh, offer a 100 percent you know satisfaction guarantee taking care of their customers so on living that's very on, cool on living material even which is like you know back when i used to work at sensi seeds people would come back and want to get free seeds and i was told by the uh, ben and all those guys you know you just tell them it's living it's living germplasm it cannot give you no money back no money <laughs> nothing <laughs> maybe and I, I, i'd have to squeeze it to get a squ- free pack out of them was was rough sometimes i'd have to really convince them and be like but these guys paid like five thousand bucks they didn't get it nothing so you know no definitely best best um policy when it comes to customer service and also just the fact that he's dealing with 35 uh, assholes like us that are all on his case and he's keeping us happy so if that's the case you know that that alone right. s- speaks for itself because you know how hard it is to keep uh your vendors happy when you're dealing with people in any kind of uh you know industry like this that's one day to the next <laughs> who knows what the fuck's going on right right so um no, he did. so we're just gonna do a good job he does a great job. So if you want to get any uh, seeds, you need to go to seedsherenow.com. You can also check out their um, Seedaholics site, seedaholics.com, and check out what they've, they've – there's a link on their site, then this site, right? So you can just jump yeah. from – You just go to auctions. and then Boom, auctions. And then you can yep. check out a real auction, not just some random guy claiming auction, picking yep. out one between one and a thousand, and you win. Now, these are like real auctions done properly on real time, which is also a nice – added touch because you know to build the back line of the back door of you know, all the back side of all this fucking internet shit is is a bitch and pain in the ass and keeping it going and keeping everybody happy because you know how people are mm-hmm. internet people want that stuff now oh, yeah. now i pushed the button three hundredths of a second ago i want it now 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 yep. so seeds here now <laughs> don't <laughs> don't take the now too literally though it could be like a day or two or three so uh welcome to the show sonny Finally, we actually told you, we, we, we told you you were going to be on the show like the last three weeks, didn't we? Like, you're on the show. You're on the right. show. You're like, you didn't even believe you were going to be on the show. You're like, I'm not even on the show. No, you're here. Okay. You are here. Yeah, I was wondering if you're actually going to get me on today. I know, right? Well, I'm impressed. Good. All right, that's good. That's, we, we, we aim to impress out here. You know that. Uh, we had a fun weekend out there, and uh, I gave everybody the little lowdown on, the, on the, the trolls that we had to deal with in the beginning of the, the show and during show. Um, right. And the fact that uh, Leafly are now the overlords of all trademark uh, deals. So now we, know, now we know. At least we know that that's who we should have been talking to the whole time. No, definitely not. Yeah, that, uh, you know, a lot of people look at Leafly and you see these trademark symbols next to every name, you know, and it, it, it's kind of, it had me wondering at first, what's going on, you know, are they trying to trademark, you know, everybody's straight names, uh-huh. or, you know, it really it comes down to the tile there. The tile there with the little chemistry logo with the, yeah. the initials of the straight, that is what's trademarked. That yeah. is their, you know, their little logo. Oh, uh, yeah. That as makes far sense. as Leafly goes, that's it, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. So. I like I like I like that explanation because I didn't even think about the fact that 
that's what the untrained eye may see when they look. They're like, oh, look, right. trademarked. They own them all. It's like, really? Wow, that'd, that'd be a good company. No wonder they were. I mean, that's the thing is Leafly, it was one of those companies when they came out. It's like the classic where, you know, we're all nuts and bolts kind of guys. And we're all like, hey, I make this and I put it in here and I give it to you and you give me that. And it's all like, makes sense. You know, and then you get a company like that that comes in and is like sucking up all this information. And then all of a sudden you find out that they're selling for some crazy amount of money. And you're like, the fuck do they even do? Like, do they do anything? Like, ah. right. Drives drives people you know, like myself nuts sometimes because I'm like, wait a minute. So we just fed them all that information and now they're going to get paid for it? Like, that doesn't even make any sense. But I guess it And there's still a lot of misinformation on their site, you know, in regards to which strains are what and what are the parents of these strains or who actually made some of them. So they're, they're getting on top of it a little, a little bit more from what I see and from my understanding. Uh, talking well, about we had those other guys. We had the other guys on the show. What was their name again? What was the other guy's names? You know? You remember? The other site? Come on. You can do it. Sonny. I the, know other you know. site. the other guys that no, there was another site that we met at the show that James is working with that I feel bad that I can't remember. Uh it's got like a canon something name in it. Canafo. Canafo? Canafo. Canafo. Canafo, that's what it is. Canafo. Like the oh, ones that Canifo. is Canafo, yeah, yep, yep. Yep. And yep. so those guys were like they were actually more cool when you went and looked at it because they tagged anything and like they you did like meta tagging of everything so like literally if i put in seeds and if i put in sage and sour into their search engine anything and everything not just like seeds it's like it goes into videos it goes into rap songs that maybe even used it and there's just like it, it was pretty pretty intense i was like wow this is like about 10 more pages than i would have expected you know what i mean when i punched in mk ultra or something like that and th seeds um so they definitely did their homework, and cool. they're apparently – it's all the same idea, except it's a little bit more – and it's funny because it looks like the same, doesn't it? <laughs> it kind of looks the same, right, when you pulled it up? You're yeah, like, Yeah, right. it kind of looks the same. It has the same color scheme. Same for color the scheme. But uh, – and well, the thing is that most people don't realize it because they, they jump on it the first page, they see the strains, and they don't mm. realize there's all those other things going on. So there's there's more to it than just that page. There's like – there's like a whole other, yeah, whole, the whole other levels. So did you uh, catch any crazy new, uh, I usually pick like one nugget per show. Did you get any nuggets at the show? Yeah, I got some nuggets at the show. You did? Um, yeah, I, I, there's some nice samples that, that I got. One of the ones that, that stuck out to me as far as flower samples, uh, somebody brought a nice sample of uh, some old C4, some Chimera work. Uh, that was pretty interesting. Um, and then I got uh, some sauce of my pink lemonade, which is absolutely phenomenal. Great stuff. Yeah, I got to like uh, you're dabbing straight out of a uh, country time pink lemonade. <laughs> great, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, when we were at uh, we got to see all the little things brought to J- James's little like uh, gift gifts, his little his offerings, which were nice. Uh, right from Sasquatch and from all those from a couple different crews. Um, that were there and it's good to see the work being because that's the whole thing too that's the other part of the other side of seeds here now which is like he gives out a shitload of seeds to the right people who actually grow them properly to give us an idea of what the fuck's going on with them you know which is which is important because that's it's also like you know it's easy to not be on top of your game when when you're moving a lot of product and you're not actually you know involved in the seeing it in full, you know, and it's in, especially when it's like it's an unfinished product. You're giving somebody, here you go, and then you never know. And that's only based right. on, you know, and usually people don't tell you until something goes wrong, right? Eh, I got one problem. <laughs> and then you hear about it, but you don't hear about the good ones usually until later. You know. But did you uh, run into any, yeah, any, any you have because you were local, well, right? They, well, go ahead. I was just saying, you were, it, for you, that's a local show, so did you... Uh, get to see any of your own stuff that uh, anybody bring in any of your own product? Because I'm sure that's 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 the... Uh... Yeah, I got the, the pink lemonade sauce. Right. Um, let's see what else. No, all the other flowers were just random other things. Mm-hmm. So. But, uh, no, no, I just got, uh, last night I got the Double the Purple Doja a clone gifted back to me. It's the mother that in-house uses and a bunch of other a bunch of other new guys here. And is that is that from your hands? Is that from your hands to them direct, or is that something that they selected out of seed? No, this is actually well, it's for my seed stock, but uh-huh. it's a clone that 
been circulating for a while. Gotcha. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick it here in the, the Philo Scout, and then I'm going to stick up some other DPD and start kind of filling in that little cluster and see what we can find out, uh, you know, right. about the origins of some of the stuff. What is Blackberry? What are the genetics behind it? Is it, uh, you know, did, Pakistani Citral? You did know, you, did you, listen to, you listen to the uh, show last time with Mad Farmer? I have not. Okay. And uh, I, I, that's bad, my, my bad list. Sonny. I've been going since last Thursday. Bad Sonny. <laughs> well, you could have on those. I haven't had any day off. I know. Well, yeah. You didn't get to fly this time either, right? Because you were just driving around, so that kind of sucks. But that's where I get to catch up is always on the flight. I'll be like, oh, I better listen to a couple of podcasts on the show. And, um, anyway, because we, we talked um, with him about um, the Purple Urkel kind of history and, you know, realized pretty quickly that it wasn't like his work at all you know he, he got it from the, the family of course as always it always comes down to a family that's running, <laughs> running all the good shit right <laughs> but uh, so he basically kind of you know said no no I'm not I'm just you know again just the shepherd uh, but but he was close to the source of course and um, so that's kind of one of the reasons why we thought we'd have a little follow up show just because we didn't really get to too much nuts and bolts on the breeding side of the purples we got more onto the you know the the the, the ins and outs of, of trying to maintain a strain for 20 plus years, which is, we all know that's also another, it's another whole struggle. You know what I mean? It's like keeping right. it, keeping it healthy, keeping it out of their hands of the right, of the wrong people, keeping it in their hands of the right people and getting it back when you fuck up, just like, you know, like you're now getting strains back. I mean, maybe you didn't fuck up, but just time, time tells, you know, all of a sudden 20 years later, you just don't have what you had because, Lo and behold, we're human, and we we, we we don't we don't actually we don't actually we're not always on top of it, you know what I mean? Or or we think we are, and uh, it is like the the holy grail when you can get something back that you actually were familiar with and lost somewhere along the line, I and mean, that's great. It's a pretty awesome feeling. Um, yep, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, we just recently had a friend who was sort of a bunch of genetics, and somebody threw a cigarette into the the pine needles underneath the pine tree across the way no and way. the fire spread all the way across the lawn and caught the house on fire and that garden burnt down. Whoa. And, uh, yeah, right. So it's like, you may think that shit's always secure, but mm-hmm. you know, you gotta always have those extra backups around. So yeah, well, yeah, well, man, trial by fire, trial by, always f- something. trial by fire is something I'm a hundred percent familiar with. And it's a terrible, <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible feeling because literally after the fact, you start thinking about like how, how fucked it is in the, in the actual room when it really happens. Like, your plants are in there. They're, like, sensing something's wrong. Like, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, they're on fire. Like, <laughs> like imagine what the fucking plants are going through. It's just nuts. Yeah. And they can't run. They can't run. They can't hide. Nope. It just comes closer and closer, and then it just starts... Me- like, And then, you know, imagine, because their roots are all... In, if they're nicely watered, they're probably steaming in the beginning. It's like a lobster cooking or something, and they're screaming. <laughs> You can't hear them, of course, because it's in the wrong fucking frequency. But it's terrifying. you know they're screaming, right? So imagine seeing those boiling, yep. boiling roots. <laughs> Back in the day, that was a big joke in my world. Was uh, some guy came in and said, like seriously said, "You guys do boil your roots, right?" And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" He's like, "Oh yeah, at harvest we pull them out of the ground and then we boil the roots and then that forces the THC to the top." I was like, "All right, this guy's <laughs> out oh of his gosh. mind," you know what I mean? <laughs> wow. But it was literally like a. He was so serious. He was like, "No, you got to do it, man." I'm like, "No, I don't think we're gonna be doing that." But maybe he's right. Maybe that would be the. You ever heard that one? It's the opposite of making plants purple, I guess, because purple you make them cold. This time you're burning the roots. Right, so you make them cold. Probably the wrong idea for. So, so when speaking of purple in general, did you, um, did you go directly into genetic purples, or did you? work with other plants that were more like influenced and turned purple and kind of found your way further down trying to make them purple. Cause I know you guys, cause really, be... really I was just handed, you know, plants that were dominantly kind of purple. So hmm. it was, you know, working with purple, which just kind of started as here, you know, you're these genetics that do this here's, you know, we had the black Russian and that it was, we only had, I had one female and then I had one male. So I mean, it was pretty much a, you know, well, I tell, I tell what I had and sort of go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I tell young breeders, like if they say, what should I do to do, you know, I'm like, why don't you start not, not necessarily, I don't want people stepping on your toes, but I'm just like, why don't you get a purple strain and a green strain and start like that? Right. Because you're going to learn so much more 
just because of the you fact really that do. you can actually visually see what the fuck's going on compared to like, yeah, I'm going to take a diesel and a cushy thing and I'm going to like, what? they like almost the same. You know what I mean? They don't really, kind of be hard to see. You might, he might hit the nail on the head, but you also might go off. But, you know, you can really, well, especially like when you get the ones that have like purple top of the leaf and green bottom of the leaf and then the next one next to it is the other way around. Or, you know, <laughs> you're like, okay, that's mm-hmm. kind of, so you can really like write down your results. It's almost like the original bean experiments, you know what I mean? Where it's like purple bean, green bean. Oh, equals one green bean for every, you know, purple, three purple ones. So. That's a that's a great way to learn the square, you yeah. know, to figure out how... The pun is square, pun square, square right? Yep. Yep, and uh, yeah, because you're going to have the vis- visualization of, you know, all right, this is my purple phenotype, this is my green one, and yep. you just square everything up. You see everything a lot more than just trying to go through a square naturally being like, all right, this one's tall, this yeah. one's short, you know, trying to use the standards. But uh, no, I think that's a great way to learn, and mm-hmm. uh, these days colors are more prominent, and it's easier to find purple strains for sure. new breeders to work with, and um, yeah. And so, and and but, so, since you have a lot of experience with them, did you find um, that people uh, kind of unwill, like like unwittingly, were drawn towards them for medicinal purposes more than for people who were just like hard headed and wanted oh, it's got to be cushioned, it's got to be strong, it's got to be like? Did you kind of see that as a pattern at all? Well. People are, you know, are always just, they're, uh, purple in color in general really just, you know, it, it, it's very appealing to purple, or people, not purple. But, uh, so that's something that's very attractive. There's definitely there's certain types of people that see that and they have, have experiences with purple varieties and they haven't been too potent and they have that stigma in their head that, oh, that's not going to get me high, I just want that Uchi Kush. You know, and there are some outdoor growers I know that don't like to run purples because, you know, after it sits and cures in the bag, it goes from that beautiful purple to, like, a dark gray, or it just mm-hmm. kind of changes colors. And people, you know, that that tends to be uh, produce flowers that have less bag appeal. Sure. Um, but as far as medicinals, it, I, I think, um, you know, it, it, I, so I started working with purple, and I kind of started wondering, you know, what, what, what causes these colors to happen? And that's kind of when I, in my personal discoveries, I, you know, discovered the anthocyanins, and that's what was, mis- you know, making these plants purple. Okay. Um, and anthocyanins are, you know, they're, they're wonderful. Uh, basically, so let's, let's talk about, like, the food group for a minute. So when you look at foods, all the foods that have anthocyanins are, like, grapes, pom- pomegranates, mm-hmm. and uh, really heavy antioxidant-rich plants. Sure. Um, and the same thing goes for cannabis, you know, so the same anthocyanins that are in the cannabis strains, yeah, they may not be so incredibly potent, but they have a huge, you know, wonderful terpene level, and then they have all these hidden unknowns that are in there. And that, that's kind of been my belief for like the past 10 years is there's a lot more going on with cannabis that has these anthocyanins in there that I think in the next few years, now that we have science being able to work with us, that's one of the, the most beautiful things about this age and time is we have all these groups of people who have don't have the backgrounds that we have. They have all the scientific backgrounds, and they're able to, you know, kind of step out and step out the shadows and work with all of us. And you know, now this is really the, in the next couple of years. I think we're going to see a lot of like the the chirpings that don't have names and the cannabinoids that don't have names. Mm-hmm. So we're going to you know really start filling out a lot of those and figuring out exactly what they are, what they do. Um, and the same thing with uh, anth- anthocyanins. I think that's something that we're really going to see. You know, like, oh, wait a minute, there is something more here with these plants just besides the cannabinoids and the terpenes. So, I don't know, that's my two cents on it. And, uh, yeah, just, you know, back in the day, just smoking the purples, I always knew that there was something else there. Mm-hmm. And uh, medicinally and therapeutically, they always treat me, you know, a little bit different. And, yeah, I noticed yeah, when I, I noticed more, there. I was never a really big purple fan because in Holland, they really would that they grow really well, purples there. They do really well in the cold climate and they kind of like, Right. always made it through so like you just got bombarded with outdoor purple in the one time a year and then indoor there was like never a really it wasn't really very many good strains there that kind of like held their own you know what i mean for, for a long time there'd be certain ones that would come up and then of course there was the conditional purple stuff all the time because it was you know the winter time you're running you're just blasting them with cold air or your people would 
you know, take out the heaters in their hydro setups and for the last week and let them just kind of color up or something like that. You know, there's that kind of purple, but those are definitely not like the purple number one that they would sell from, for instance, that homegrown fantasy was like that Nigerian black kind of stuff. You know, it was black, Mm -hmm. black. (laughs) And and again, it didn't, it was like a lot of leaves, very leafy and... But it would produce, you know, decent looking buds. And again, Holland is like the worst outdoor condition place. So it's one of those things where you, it's like all the humidity and stuff of the Northwest without any of the net nature, you know? So there's no, there's no ecosystem at all. It's like a bunch of sterile, weird, you know, the, the soil is all reclaimed and not very good. So, so it's like Holland was never, that was the other good part about growing seeds in Holland is I always felt like, whatever you produced there, whenever they would go somewhere that was like Cali or Oregon or something like that, they'd be so fucking happy. <laughs> they'd be like, oh my God, right. this is awesome. Compared to like growing them in Cali or in Oregon and then getting them to somebody in fucking Amsterdam where it's really wet and cold and they'd be like, well, this sucks. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, what am I going to do now? So for, from, a, from a reverse point of view, it seems to work. Um, so, so were you, when the beginning, when you were uh, playing around with this stuff, I mean, were you even producing seeds back then or were you just kind of like more of a, rec- a more of, you know, personal grower or did you get the fever right out of the game? When, when are you asking? Just like when you, um, started growing these, when you, when you were doing these purple strains, I mean, cause you said like you were handed them, but it was yeah. at, at that time. After, when I was doing the, yeah. when I was doing the purples, I was already pretty much in the seed shit. So, okay. uh, that was, that was like really the early days of, uh, TGA back in the day. Um, mm-hmm. when PGA was coming online. So we were already, I was already producing some stuff like the Lemon Freeze and some of my other varieties. Um, but then the Purples were kind of the second lead into like the, you know, the next big project that I did for a few years there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's solely what I focused, focused on there, which is breeding purple. So. <laughs> and yeah, and you got the most response out of it, I guess, because people really, you know, um, I mean, then it was also a little bit more, uh, I guess I have an online presence. You weren't really going to shows and things, right? You were just kind of doing everything through, right? Through them and yep, through, through. And so, what was it like being in that kind of? Because I know that was definitely a. Uh, you know, it's always about timing with, with anything, especially cannabis related. Like sometimes, you know, there'll be a whole group of people, and you're doing stuff, and you're working, and you're doing your thing, and you, you might even at that moment in time be the only ones doing whatever you're doing, just because everybody's pretty innovative, but also kind of isolated you know like we're not uh, not everybody's right. taking everybody's tech maybe nowadays a little different because i mean it's got <laughs> it's gotten a little quicker you know back in the day it was a little bit more mm-hmm. like you had to log in on a computer not like on your phone and then you had to actually like you know sit there and transfer pictures and do all the fun stuff <laughs> yeah and it wasn't like boom 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 i mean now it's like crazy right how hyperactive everything is and easy and you know like even like micro, uh, microscopic pictures 10 years ago were like you had to invest a lot of money and you had to put all this energy into it and by the time and you had to have the cannabis to take the picture of so you mean the chances of being that guy were very slim or you had to know a bunch of people and now it's like right just, yeah i mean <laughs> just on the you know now, now, now you can pop a lens on the back of your iphone and take a picture yeah exactly nice even better than some yeah. of the ones that we were doing with the higher quality equipment in the beginning just because technology has gotten that much, you know, the pixel rates are so much higher and the, you know, things that you could do on your phone now are just like what you could have done on your uh, SLR thousands of dollars, you know, <laughs> later if you had the money, you know, and the energy. But uh, uh, it was definitely an interesting time back then, you know, uh, all those years ago, first of all, we really didn't have digital cameras in the very beginning. A lot of people were taking their pictures on Polaroids, you know, just so they could get that instant gratification of having a picture and not having to go develop a mm-hmm. roll of film with a bunch of pictures on it. You know, yeah, oh, yeah. total um, risk. And then I remember, you know, some of the first digital cameras. I remember when I got my first digital camera that was worth a shit. And it was like a four megapixel with an eight time optical zoom. And that's a great macros for back in the day. I still look at some of those macros, you know, these days. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing for how shitty the camera it was back then. But yeah, that was a lot of work, you know. And like I said, transferring pictures back and forth. And it was a lot of time to sign into the boards and sift through all the stuff that you had to look at and, you know, write up your little blurb and pop up a picture. And mm-hmm. what it's, you know, different days these days with Instagram and all the 
Yeah, well, the ease of how easy you know it is for somebody to start a seed company and uh, you know show their product off and get a following. It's, it's so. so know, what year? The gratification is based. What year was it when you started working with TGA and kind of doing that? Was that in the? Uh, I would say you know right, right around 2003 is when okay. all that really got started and put in motion like hardcore 2002 2003. Right, because it was interesting being from from my side like, you know, it was very. Uh, kind of in the in the moment when I was in Amsterdam I wasn't really even very internet like interested for a long time because of the fact that it was like well I was just busy doing what I was doing and I would kind of like get these little like glimpses because I'd be going on I'd go on to overgrow or something like that and I would get like some information from you know some of the stuff I thought was actually and I was a little bit late getting in but all of a sudden I was like oh this shit's actually pretty cool um and that was around I would say to 99, 2000, 2001, or something like that, that those range. And then right when IC Mag started, because, of course, his whole thing was kind of paralleling whatever they were doing. And, right. and I was hearing lots of chatter, so I was like, hmm, this is interesting. But, from, but, it was inter- but what I noticed was that, like, like, for instance, Rez, of course, was very, you know, like, high-fiving himself all over the Internet and, and getting sales, you know what I mean? And I was like, oh, huh, is that what you got to do? You got to go on there and make up stuff and just kind of, like pretend you're cool and then people will buy it and I kind of saw it happening and and then then when he came out and then like uh you know uh they all came out and then uh Cali Connection and all those guys came out to to the cup I think around right, probably around 2005 or 6 or something like that maybe a little later even and it was like and I could just see how those generations were coming out like the people were coming I was like oh these are the this is that whole other world where people trust each other online, you know what I mean? Where I was kind of like, no, just come into the store <laughs> and we'll talk to you and direct in the store, you know what I mean? And there wasn't that many people with that option, but now, of course, those options are there. And, uh, you know, I kind of think you're, people kind of have to still think the same. Like, if you do stuff online, you're probably getting a piece of the puzzle, but maybe not the whole thing, you know? Um, yeah. have, you, have you found a lot of misinformation online about things that you've done, like, with the work back in the day? Yeah, you know, it, there's definitely some misinformation out there. Um, and then there's also just not a lot of information. Um, you know, after I left TGA, just kind of like I kind of got written out of the books. And then, you know, I just kind of went into hiding for a few years and just doing my own thing. And then, you know, when you do that, of course, you know, a lot of mystery gets put out there. And you're like, huh, wait a minute. Or, you know, like you look in the, uh, what is it, the Cannabis Indica book, for example. You look at Double Purple Dojo and it talks about, you know, Outlaw and Matthew Wright and stuff like that, but it doesn't ever state my name in there. You know, and a lot of that has to do with me just not being around during that time. Uh-huh. Um, you know. And then you have to come back and you have to fix all that stuff. You're like, wait a minute, that's my, you know. So, yeah, so definitely, definitely some stuff on the Internet, and the Internet is totally full of a lot of misinformation just all across the board, you know, just, you know, even for just trying to find information about breeding or growing or whatever. I mean, it's still these days, it's a lot harder. Um, you know, the, the boards are full of shit, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you got to go stick through to find that right piece of information. And you got to double back with another site to see if you're even, you know, correct. I feel right. bad for a lot of these guys out on the East Coast, you know, trying to learn a lot of this stuff. And it's just like, wow, I feel bad for you, you know. There's a lot of information out there. Yeah, I mean, coming in from a, as a total, like, noob right now would be rough, you know. It would be like, whew, you got a lot, a lot on your plate. Right. That to kind of digest, and then on the end of the day, find out that most of it wasn't even really true anyway. Like shit, I just <laughs> somehow I had to wade through all that. Um, you know, yeah, and I mean, it is it is uh, like when I was about, yeah, I guess twenty or so, and I was you know, traveling and doing things, and pre pre going to Amsterdam was like the, the year I kind of like decided I was going to go there. Um, but you know, it was like if you if you take that that time period and you kind of compare it to now. And there was not very good information at that time, but there was a few books and there was a few things. And I, I remember, like, I had you know, I had the Bible and you had you had Jorge's book and you had Ed's books and you had a. But it was like the time when I was still wasn't really growing yet, and I was just trying to like imagine growing. <laughs> and it was like <laughs> compared to now, where uh, because then it was just like there was so many unanswered questions and there was really nowhere to go to, and now there's it's the opposite. There's too much information. So you almost have to like, now you have to chisel your way through and not, you know, not listen to somebody else who's just claiming four pounds of light and all the, you know, 
all the things all the things we know like no no don't don't listen to that that's a bad idea you know because you know it's bullshit at that point and uh I mean, Oregon's I think you guys are, and you've been in Oregon the whole time right like you haven't really moved from anywhere in particular nope yeah this has been my home this has been your home the whole time I mean I was saying earlier on the show that I think Oregon's one of the more mature markets here in general before it became legal you know what I mean just in the sense of always having you know a pretty solid uh, pretty solid group of growers pretty solid group of like uh, you know consumers are pretty well educated for the for the you know for what they were, and also um, self-sufficient, you know, uh, which Certainly. which a lot of states aren't. You know? I mean, they just don't even have that. So for them, they're starting from from scratch. Uh, what happened with like so? So did you uh, support the whole medical thing, and then that kind of just fell apart up there, didn't it? Or did it? Is it even... Yeah, yeah. I've been a patient for going on seventeen years here. And uh, yeah, I've definitely seen the program start and flourish and go through its changes, and now it's just been pretty much demolished. When we passed the uh, Measure 91, which was more legalized, basically it said in the, the framework of that that they weren't going to touch medical. But, you know, just what, what happens with every program is once that next legislative session happens, the first thing that they want to do is they want to go ahead and start cutting the stuff that, you know, things like medical here. So we've gone through a lot of different changes, and uh, just recently they changed our... Um, with our cards per card, you could flower six plants, and then previously we had unlimited veg counts. So we get uh, you know, 10,000 seedlings running on the side or whatever. And now they just took that down to 12. So that was a real big kick in the nuts here. So, and unfortunately, a lot of uh, patients around here, you know, everybody's going wrecked, and a lot of these patients are losing their growers because all their growers are switching over to the rec system. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of people really need medicine that are, you know, really getting screwed over. It's, it's sad to see. But, um, you know, I don't know, just trying to figure out solutions around it to keep on helping people. Um, you know, things like growing hemp and CBD and stuff like that, that's just kind of arriving at me. Kind of shifting my focus a little bit more, you know, just figuring out how I can help more people on a larger scale rather than, um, you know, just on the, the local level. Well, yeah, and, and also not be tied up with, not have your hands tied so much with, you know, a bunch of bullshit as far as delivery and how you're going to get it to the people and how much they're going to have to pay, right. tax for me, you know, how the taxes are going to lay out, because at the end of the day, you're just making the man, you're making the man money, you know what I mean? So, um, th- yeah, I think that's kind of the inevitable sad side of this industry where it's like, kind of like, don't you guys, like, don't you remember that in 95 when there was no medical? Golly, that's how it happened. Like, that's how this whole shift is happening. And then you go, know, like, now you see the greed kind of kicking in. And watching pretty much Cali is going to be your your litmus test. You know what I mean? If they, when they turn on medical, which probably will happen really fast. You know what I mean? I can already you see know, it. Uh, and that Cali's a, Cali's crazy. If you look at it, the people who passed it in, in California, the same people who passed legalization in Washington. And mm-hmm. you know, when they passed the when they set up the I five two, they did away with medical, and there's no home growing. So there's no record. It's all corporate feed. Mm-hmm. And those are the same people who just set up and who are putting Prop 64 in place right now down there. So I think, you know, we've already seen a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, zoning, a lot of people, the the counties and the cities, you know, trying to do the the banning or they all want their excess uh, tax money. And now they're trying to shift a lot of the cultivation spots into certain areas. And, you know, for for personal growth or no, just for, for the rec. For rec. rec Yeah. But I think for for the medical, it's, I, I don't know. I, I'm feeling for everybody in California right now. So yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. it's like if it, it's places that are, you know, historically been growing cannabis the most, that are getting hit the worst because, of course, they're the softest target out there because they've been doing it right. the most open for the most time. And so all of a sudden, you know, you're going to crack down on them. And then, of course, Eddie Lepp's whole fucking situation ain't helping, is it? Like <laughs> that's that's like a <laughs> shit show on top of everything. Like where it's just turning that county into a it's going to be a nightmare there. I would be feel I feel sorry for anybody who lives there because he's definitely uh, right. put a target on everybody's back there, big time. And uh, I saw some stuff where it was just like all the locals were 
getting because this is this is what we've we've done. We've we've armed our people with way too much technology. So people are pulling up Google images of from Google Earth of all the farms around them from even last year because you know Google Earth's not really updated <laughs> on a regular. But it's that easy right. for someone to go home and go, oh yeah, I'll show them what's going on. Look, boom, count all the plants. You know, you can already count them right from space because they're huge, and so. It's not too hard to figure out. You can pretty much sit there and go like, okay, yeah, well, well, they're over the limit. And, you know, and, and I mean, some of those places are saying 12 plants, you know I mean? It's like, really? Like, oh my right. God, like there's no way because these people have been, and some of them are zoned out completely and they're still growing like in the open. So yeah, I mean, Cali's going to be in for some weird next two years or so, two or three years. And I'm even hearing some things right now about California, how they're talking about doing away with public consumption. So if they do stuff like that, we, we've already faced that kind of stuff. Uh, they, they, Washington went through that. There's no more shows in Washington that have consumption. Here in Oregon, we, we did away with that. There's only one social club a year now. Yeah. But California is next, and that's the next thing that they're talking about. And if you do away with that, there's not going to be any you know, consumption at Cups or the Chalice, any of those events. Or not, you know, If you, you take away consumption from those events, what are they? You know? mm-hmm. um, it's so hypocritical yeah. too, because of the fact that I mean, there's so many can- there's so many alcohol related, uh, just you know, beer conventions and beer shows and uh, hard alcohol. I mean, right. you get a tequila, sh- you can walk around and drink ninety kinds of tequila in the sun, and you know what I mean. It's like, yep. what good is that? You know what I mean? Is that, that going to do anybody any good? I don't care how little you drink. If you drink on uh, ninety different kinds of tequila, you're going to get fucked up. You know what I mean? And it's definitely not doing your liver, or your kidneys any good either. And you know, there's so much. I mean, that's the crazy part is there's so much evidence on cannabis, you know, we know all the, we know how it mitigates all these other issues that you would have when you have an alcohol-based uh, event. And I don't think any of us, I mean, <laughs> now that I don't drink beer, I'm like, yeah, I don't think any of us would care if we didn't have alcohol. But I mean, realistically, right. if, it, if it came down to saying, hey, we can't have alcohol at a cannabis event, I'd much rather have a cannabis event anyway. You know Me what I mean? Too. Because it's like Absolutely. you're going you're to go home. And, and actually make it home first of all, you know what I mean? You're not gonna, <laughs> right. you, and on top of that, you're gonna you're, you're gonna have a much better crowd. You're gonna have a much better vibe, and it's way easier to tell a bunch of stoners that there's not gonna be beer than to tell a bunch of beer drinkers that there's not gonna be. Any, hey guys, you know what? We can't have any weed here, okay? And be like, well, whatever. Yeah, you know, a couple right. guys will complain, but they'll go smoke anyway. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but yeah, it's sort of like the the same issues we have here in Colorado. That's why. That's why. That's why people like myself who, you know, moved here thinking this is going to be like, I literally, when I moved here, it was like, I, I came, I went to a show at Cervantes and it was like, I saw kids walking around with rigs, like on the dance floor, just doing dabs and stuff. And I was like, oh man, I'm moving here, dude. This is it. This is it. I'm moving here because this is even better than Amsterdam at this point. You know what I mean? And now you can't smoke at Cervantes, anything. They're all hardcore. Now you can't, now any all the things that kind of cracked open here that were cool, including even what I was doing at my spot. I mean, I, I, I had to, didn't have to close, but I mean, it was kind of one of those, I wasn't making any money with it and I couldn't really justify just having a smoking spot like that. But at the same time, kind of expected more places to come on board. And at the end of the day, it's like a couple did, but it's very hard to do a, to make a program without any kind of rules that make any sense you know what i mean there's like just none right so you're taking a huge risk for no money which is not a good idea you know what i mean it's not what we need to be doing these days so that's where all these events kind of just fizzle out because people who don't know think yeah we're gonna have this and we're gonna do that and you're like no you're not <laughs> you know what i mean you can't and then right. and then when reality kicks in it's canceled you know what i mean we've had that on multiple events here cannabis cup included you know like two years yeah. ago. I mean, so yeah, it is, seems like that's kind of where we're at in the, in the social side where it's like, but I did notice when I was ever, when I was in Portland and when I was in both Portland, and Seattle, kind of everywhere in the Northwest that everybody there is a little more, uh, true old school stoner vibe than I do get here. You know what I mean? Like here I get the kind of, like everybody's got a little sealed bag and they're smoking vape pens and you're like, what? You know what I mean? And then you go there and it's like, I get off the plane and before I've even gotten to the rental car place, there's already people smoking bowls in the parking lot. You know what I mean? And I'm like, all right. And these are people yep. I don't know. These are just some random people. It's like, yeah, that's what I want to see. Random people smoking bowls in parking lots. That's pretty much, right. then I know I'm in the right place. Like, exactly. all right, everybody here seems, yeah, they're all, you know, cool. 
and uh, everybody's everybody's pretty out for it, you know, with, with the culture here, and it's it's definitely something I you know embrace here. I like it, and you know, we were we were all just back east a few weeks ago, and you go there, and everybody's like hiding around the corner trying to hit their shit, or you know, right. it's just like two different worlds, man. Well, Beautiful that that one spot that we go to, um, what was that place that we went to for the? You guys always we always have the pre party there. Um, the, the bar that we had, the thing that we were at last. I, I didn't make it this time because I missed the first day. But you guys always have the pre parties there. Do uh, you know what I'm talking about in Portland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, the, the social club. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when yeah, you and, yeah. just when you, I mean, when you realize like, okay, is this really it? This is it. This is the only place, you know, it's like, damn, like, it's just like such a slap in the face for the industry as far as like, we're invest, we're, we're creating hundreds of millions of dollars, you know what I mean? It's like, really? Like, right. come on. Um, yes. You just need to get place to, uh, people a place to consume safely, you know, and unfortunately we just really don't have much of that. And the, the only club that exists here, they're only existing because it was previously a cigar lounge. So right. They bought that license. Right. And that's how they're... Yeah, and I mean that's the thing here. There is a bunch of like hookah bars and places like that, but none of them really right? take into account like, hey, you guys have the you guys do have the license that's required to smoke indoors. In it's the only one that'll let you do that. So you, why don't you let people smoke weed? You know, and it's like I've I've already tried it a couple of them, but unfortunately, most of those places are owned by guys who just narrow-minded in their own way, you know what I mean? Because they're selling right. their sheesh and their bullshit and their fucking tobacco crap that they want to get people to buy, you know what I mean? Right. You're like, no, people don't need to buy this stuff or consume this stuff. Um, so, innovatively-wise, what do you see for... Uh, what, did you see anything else at the show the other day? Did you see anything beyond, like, the genetics-wise? Did you see anything, like, equipment-wise or... or Road techniques, yeah, or not so much. Yeah. You know, it's, it seems like every couple of shows, I'll, I'll see somebody with some product that makes me like do a double take, like, hmm, we got something there. Yeah, that's my that's yeah, my but goal. For the most part, it's just pretty redundant. That was my goal at every show, um, pretty much, just to figure that out. Right. Yeah. You know, recently, we've been uh, working with some uh, some people who have some plasma lighting that's just next level shit. Absolutely. Well, that's just something to discuss. Um, yeah. w- is Wolf involved? No, Wolf is not involved, but he is incredibly excited. Okay, so you know long, when Wolf's excited, yeah, I was gonna there's say, something going on there. I was going to say. Cause <laughs> actually, because we were talking about plasma lighting, I think he may have mentioned the same thing. That's why I was asking. Because, uh, yeah, for me, for me, plasma is an interesting uh, concept because I was so gung-ho about it. When the first, the very, very, very first one came out, it was um, Theo from Gavita who showed it to me, and it was the number one prototype and thing was badass, right? And he, he took it to um, Cannabis Cup, I believe it was around 2003 or four, maybe. It was uh, one of the last ones at this uh, one spot that we used to go to. And anyway, though, so I did a show. I asked him if he could help me out and do, kind of help me out. Uh, I was going to be doing like a, I had like an hour to do a, a spot, and I was like, man, I need, I need some filler, man. Went out to their spot. He's like, shall we, you know, premiere the first plasma light? I'm like, sure. And the crazy part about the first one, and is, and I guess this is what Wolf told me that this, the newer ones from Gavita are don't do, which I was pretty, un, pretty like surprised at, because the original one, the whole cool part about it was there was no wires connecting the bulb to the ballast. Everything was done with microwave. Right. Everything's microwaves, right? And the bolt. And when you actually saw the plasma ball, and you put a and you put like a uh, welding mask on, and you look at it, that plasma ball would be rotating like the sun, you know, like a little Death Star or something like that, right? And you'd be like, "Oh my God, that is the coolest shit ever!" Right? But apparently, because then my guys from uh, New Millennium uh, were running a tent a test with plasma lighting and they fucking just had a complete die off it was pure plasma nothing but and they were like whoa that's crazy and i was was like really like i thought i was supposed to be the closest to the sun spectrum but apparently the the newer ones from gavita when they went and actually manufactured them they didn't do that they didn't rotate like that and it was like a lower quality plasma and apparently didn't work (laughs) like so it did not work works as a supplement light you can use it in a supplement with another light but you can't use it on its own which totally so blew these my people mind. have 
these people have the first plasma. They were, they were the first with the plasma on the market long ago. Mm-hmm. Um, they've been used in horticulture for some time now. Um, I, I believe that Gavita tried to reverse engineer their technology, from my understanding. Uh-huh. Um, but these these have these lamps have the the bulbs are. It looks almost like a crack pipe. It's just like a round sphere with gas inside of it, and it has a long tube. You put the tube up into a magnetron, so there is no ballast. Um, and then it ignites and it spins at 3,000 RPMs per uh, minute. And uh, you put your hand right on it. It does. There's no heat. Uh, it's it's totally incredible. Um, and let's see, the square footprint of this is 20 by 20 meters. Is there footprint? 20. You go on my Instagram page, there's 20, 20 by 20. It means you go on my Instagram page. Uh, there's, if you scroll down, there's a picture that has 18 Gavitas on and we are hanging the lamp on, and then over on the left is just with the plasma light on. And it's mind-blowing. Just one plasma lamp that's just igniting the whole room. I mean, it's just so lit up. Huh. And, um, and how many watts is that particular bulb, you know? Um, I believe that one is, it's like a 1,000-watt replacement. I want, I want to say it's just beneath a 1,000 watts. Like the 940 uh, or something like that. Or, yeah. yeah, it's somewhere in like the 900s. Because uh, but, uh, well, what I noticed, what, and I was really stoked about the original one, was... Um, they were showing it in uh, at the Rye, which is a huge uh, convention center in Amsterdam, and they have huge skylights above. And it's like you know that certain time of day when the light comes down, and it's like literally so thick that if somebody walks through it, they disappear within the light. It's that that thick of sunlight, and um, this light was ha- was on the ground, kind of reversed. So the light sunbeam was coming down, and the light was shooting up. And it really, at the certain moment, you were like looking at it, going like, "It's exactly the same fucking color." You could really see it was exact. That's it looked awesome. like it literally looked, looked like it was bouncing off the light and going up off of it. But it was actually the sun. Sunlight just came in at one time. But you know, in an hour later, it wasn't there anymore. But for that hour, it was the easiest sales pitch. You could just stand there with people and go, "Look, natural sunlight, plasma light," and people would be like, "Fuck, you're yeah. right. It's exact." And when you looked at it on a graph, it was even more like crazy because it followed it like a roadmap, you know, like up and down every little nook and cranny, and it just totally and, and utterly uh, duplicated sunlight at that point. And that was the original. That was supposedly the original one in Holland, so it could have been just the first of the retrofitted from your from your friend's place. I wouldn't doubt right, it. Right, right. I would, would not doubt right. it. Um, but that was also like ten years ago or so, and it was kind of like hmm, over ten yeah. years ago, and so it was like that's it. It's still, I guess it's the cost is holding it back. How much did you have any idea on the price of these ones, or is there even going to be available? These ones, I'm not too sure. I want to say, you know, I've heard as low as like 13 or 14 once they hit the market, but I think right. I could be wrong. Um, I know that the bulbs are over rated for over 100,000 hours of use. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so there's really no parts to change, or, you know, it's just, uh, then you're with no heat, you know, you're, you're using less AC. You have less power draw. Um, I think where the benefits really come in with plasma lighting is in the vegetative cycle. You know, so when you're cloning and you're taking your, you know, you're mass propagating, sure. you're getting a little speed. Your, you know, things are growing a little bit quicker, uh-huh. um, and you're giving the plant, um, you know, is, is lighting that's as close to the sun. And when you have lighting like that, that just allows for a lot of repair inside of the plant. Um, you see a lot of, a lot of more improved growth, a lot of healthier growth. Um, yeah, cool stuff, man. Yeah, it, think, it's uh, interesting. Don't you notice how, like, when you put plants that are sick, if you have any kind of sick plant, all you have to do is put it outside, and it's like, put them outside. it's like, oh, <laughs> there you go. That was easy. Like, it's literally the, the right. miracle cure for a lot of plants that have issue, <laughs> a lot of issues. You know, because it's like we're 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 trying to give them what they need, and we probably are giving them enough to keep them going. But at the same time, there's so many little bridging gap kind of light spectrums that we don't even know can't see them you know what i mean can't see it it's there you know we know what we can well we we know what we think we can see let's put it that way when you say we know what we can see but we think right. we know what we see and like you know if you uh but you're not seeing what the plants are seeing so obviously um when it comes to uh efficiency and things like that we can kind of gauge it to a point but then it's nothing compared to when you put it outside it's the same as like i tell people like Take a thousand watt bulb and bring it outside in full sunlight. You can't even see it, barely even tell if it's on. You know what I mean, it's like, is that on? Yeah, it's on. I think it's on. Because it's like those, those things are rated to a certain point and the sun just blasted out of the water. And, you know, that's, that's the, 
the future. That's what I was trying to explain the other day on the panel when uh, when that guy <laughs> said, no, it's not. I was like, well, I think it is. I think it is. The future, I believe, is pretty much going to be greenhouse and outdoor just because how are you going to compete? You know what I mean? You're not going to be able to compete cost-wise. They'll always be indoor you growing really for for you know certain extracts and things like that that are in controlled situations. But it kind of doesn't right. make sense to grow flower and competitively indoors. You know what I mean? That seems to be the... Definitely on the downward track. You were talking about holding on to strains for 20 years, and I think that one of my personal beliefs is you have to give that plant, when you have old clones that are on forever, you need to put them out in the sun. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, if you want to have good healthy cuts, you know, every year try to get that plant out in the sun and take those healthy cuts from that and continue on. I mean, that's like, that's really one of the the foolproof ways to keep a plant around long term is, you know, it can only hang out inside for so long. It yep. really needs to get outside and get that natural sunshine. And, and isn't it isn't it funny when you bring plants air. when you bring plants out and you they you can see when you, they come out for the first time they're just like freaking out. Right. They're, they're like, what is going on here? Yeah, and, and then like got three days later they're fucking loving life. Like, you know, you come right. back up they're just all praying and happy and just because also they get all that wind and just irregular things it's not like bram, 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 all the time yeah. on the same fucking thing it's like oh wow getting wind from there and getting wind from over here and getting this getting that you know actually got some action going on and some vibrations from other you know non-evasive right. insects not just insects that want to kill you <laughs> and eat you they were like hey these <laughs> things actually just want to hang out they're just flying by so yeah, you definitely see them uh, respond really quick to uh, natural sun. I always recommend it too, and especially when you take cuttings from outdoor plants, they always root faster. Like always, like right. guarantee. They really do. They you, really like do. you'll have a that's and, that, and I think that's actually the first issue, especially when it comes to like OGs and stuff like that, is your rooting time. Like that's where you see the slippage. You know what I mean? Like hey, this used to root in eight days and now it takes two weeks I wonder what's up you know and then that's just a good indicator that that plant should probably go outside and get some sun <laughs> get some sun slap it around a little bit you know what I mean because those are the those are like the first signs usually you know and then you'll get stuff like I've got certain old OG things like that RBK that it's 20 plus years and it's like bitch you know what i mean sometimes three weeks till you see real roots you know what i mean and it's like you've already made two sets of clones in the cloner and you're just like eh, it's maybe gonna come you know what i mean it's just like so slow um do you uh so what's your oldest what's your oldest plant? Outside are great too what's, what is your oldest plant right now that you have and it's like actual tissue is 20 plus years or uh, let's see, there's one, I want to say, 2017, so 17 years is the oldest plant that I have around. Gotcha. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it is like, mine is like around 25 or so, and it's like, uh, there's some issue, issue like I have uh, the Sage, I have what we call S6, which is kind of the production line of the Sage, it's like the real 50-50, and it produces great weight, and but it's also kind of like, kind of gotten weird, you know what I mean? It's one of those things where it's it's very hard to get the thing to express itself 100%. Usually what happens is about three quarters of the way through, it kind of like stops in a weird way, you know, and you're like, what is going on? And Mo was trying to figure it out, and actually he called me up the other day to to look under the root line because he was seeing discoloration within the center of the plant, and he was thinking that it was a viral condition that maybe we both had. But I but I put mine, and it was funny too because I told him, I was like, well, I put all my stuff outside for like the beginning of the year when it's total veg time, you know what I mean? I'll just stick everything into the hoop house for the, instead of keeping it indoors. And so everything gets a little bit more cleaned up. And so he was like, damn you, you're supposed to keep them inside the whole time so I can know if this works or not. But it didn't, it didn't infect any of the ones that we had, even though the plants definitely like are hurting a little bit considering they're, they're in their 25th year of rotation, you know? So, um, right. So you you work closely with uh, with Odie, but you also work with other people too, right? Yeah, I work with two also. I didn't mean like so, that. Yeah, I didn't I actually mean with, that. Odie and I, I do a bunch of crazy crazy stuff, and then uh, yeah, I've been doing a lot of CBD stuff with uh, with two the seed company and uh, a group here in Oregon. Um, we just kind of been doing our thing, and then kind of teamed up a little bit to make uh, to see what we can do to develop newer and better, you know 
breeding stock and uh, a few and I right now are working on making certified CBD hemp seed for next year. So that's something that we're working on. Um, yeah, and then Odie and I are always working on all kinds of different things here. So, yep. Was uh so with two and his CBD stuff? Are you what what, what particular um, material are you working from from him? What's your what are you using for breeding stock from him? You taking males, I guess, from uh, selection that you make? Well, actually, or? so I just put in. No, uh, I just uh, <clears throat> we just ran a bunch of seeds that uh, are hemp seeds and they don't have any they're basically uh the, the thc is not detectable on them okay. um but it has cbd markers and so we've been running through some of this stock we just got some of it tested out um and then we're using that to make some more the more uh, cbd dominant hemp varieties that's going to be certified so that's what we're doing and then uh yeah i've been i've been growing all the tsk gear for uh, well over a year now um, I, I like the cherry con hard by itself. I think it's a beautiful plant. It's got beautiful structure. It's got nice terpenes. I think a lot of the, the CBD flowers that come from the cherry con hard work, <clears throat> they have a lot more appeal than a lot of the traditional uh, CBD cultivars out there. Um, you know, there's just there's a lot more flavor and a lot of uh, terps in there that you just don't get with a lot of the traditional stuff like um, Carlos Sue and the ACDC and whatnot. So. Yeah, I like a lot of the stuff I'm seeing out of that seed stock, and it's really consistent, uh, you know, high CBD and lots of low THC stuff. So there's a lot of really hemp genetics in his, his existing stock right now. Um, and then out here with the guys that I'm working with, um, we have a, uh, a Frank's Gift by Shirley Temple male that's a 40 to 1. So it's a CBD stud that we just recently pulled out, and uh, you know, we're just kind of... Having fun with different projects and trying to do bigger, better things, and trying to you know get the medicine out in the hands of the people. You know, are the are, are any of those testers that he's doing right now? Are those any of those from your? Those, he's got like those fifty-five testers you're sending in. Yep. Those yep. So insane. all the ones that don't have the detectable THC, those uh-huh. came from me. Nice, nice. Yep. And and yeah. uh, I mean, I think that's going to be way more interesting when they understand that they need to kind of like pump up the THC level a little bit just to give everybody a little more breathing room to be able to actually produce better right. plants because right now there's, I mean, it's like, it's 0.3, but really they're talking about in Colorado at least to go up to 0.1, which would be huge. And that would like open the, right. open the doors to so many other strains to be able to be used. And also, you know, uh, not going to, it's not like it's going to make it to any point where people are going to be extracting it for THC, but it, it does make it so that you can kind of like, yeah, you just don't throw away 85% of your stuff because of that hitting that right. mark. Because uh, it seems like a lot of stuff sits around that point, the good stuff, the, the things that you like, ooh, what's that, what's that, what's that? Oh, like, po- point, like point six. Point six. Yeah, point, point seven. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like point six, point six eight, point six nine, point seven, like in that range. Those things are actually sometimes like already catching your eye, you know what I mean? But then you're like, damn. It's like, and then the ones, you know, that are, again, like I think because we're also going by numbers and we're trying to do everything scientifically, we're also lo- we, sometimes we lose that original point. Like the reason why Harlequin was such a good plan, or the reason why a lot of these other ones is because they actually tasted good too, and they actually had some something more than just the uh, numbers working out in, in your favor. Right. Um, Harlequin is bag seed, by the way. All the, to the best of my knowledge, we got a, we got the scoop on some uh, some some of the history behind like the ACDC genetics and uh-huh. who made them and what they call this T series. So basically, we, during that time, we found out some history of the Harlequin. And Harlequin is just pure bag seed. Like you read a lot of the things on like Seed Finder and whatnot, where it's trying to give you the description of this by this by you know like with or whatever. Um, that's not true. It's actually just pure bag seed. Hmm. I find that pretty interesting. Well, you and know. most of the ACDC, while we're on this subject, uh-huh. what I found out is uh, back in the day, they found when Canatonic first kind of came on the scene and they were trying to, you know, isolate some CBD and have some CBD strains, uh, Dr. Barbara, they got some, uh, some Canatonic seeds, threw it out, they selfed the CBD female, and then they grew out those seeds. Those seeds, those seeds are called the sea seeds. Mm-hmm. And uh, certain clones circulate out of there. ACDC is uh, C17. Uh, there's another one that I believe is C6, which circulates. Um, and then there's C22. C22 is what we believe is Lucy's Lion from the Growers Guild. They have a cut of ACDC that's completely different. 
but uh, yeah, it's kind of fun tracking back, you know, some of this um, CBD stuff, man. Right. You know, well, of course, a lot of it, a lot of it all goes back to Ringo and the whole you know crew back there. Yeah. So. And how and how do you think um, people locked in on finding the ones that just happen to be because because for instance, a lot of those ones are are, uh, are are those actually below point three or those are the kind of more one to ones and seven sevens and eights and. Like so the C series had like a, a consistent bell curve in life. There was like one to ones all the way over to the more extremes, which are like your more ACDC and like the C twenty two. Um, but I believe the C C six is like a perfect one to one. It's like a one one THC back C B. Right, um, and you know the the end at the end of the day when it's come when we're we're talking about CBD, the crazy part about it though is that we're not gonna very few people are going to be using them in flower form anyway. Most everything is extracted and right. turned into distillate of some sort and or, you know, isolate or distillate and then stripping all of those things that make everything special, you know what I mean? And I think... Everything that we build. <laughs> right. It's like all just, okay, well, we're going to get... We're going to strip everything away to get to this one part of it, which, you know, we all know works but doesn't work as good as it does when it's working together with in conjunction with THC. So you end up with a sort of a, you're taking something that was super special, had a one to one or 40 to one or 20 to one, you know, all these different uh, balances that were all, you know, independently effective on their own sort of playing field. Then all of a sudden now you're taking them and stripping them down and trying to like put that back into something. I mean, I think we're, we're kind of losing our, we're, we're definitely going to lose our way if people, uh, kind of continue in the, the, the format that we're doing, you know, like I, I feel like right. we need to stick to the holistic side of it all and kind of like get people to try different. Cause that's the thing is every time you you pack, you throw down a pack of seeds, it's like rolling dice. You know what I mean? And you just get like that perfect combination. Can't even, there's no way to beat that. You know what I mean? Like thinking about that, right. like, like, okay, you got that perfect combo. It works really well. You know, how are you going to strip it and recombine it and make it ever work again as effectively? You know, I don't think it can. Exactly. Personally. I mean, and each combination works completely different with all of us. You know, it's these patients trying to find just, you know, a single strain that's going to help, you know, their, their needs. They don't really understand that that single strain is all over the place. You know, the, the chemotype changes, the protein percentage changes from garden to garden, grow to grow. So, yeah, it's, Right. Yep. Well, you know, and the thing is, uh, you have like a honeymoon effect too. So you could find a thing that works great, then two weeks later don't even work at all. You know, especially the more acute right. your situation is, and the more critical like it is that this is doing its thing. Because, as we know, you know, human body is definitely going to uh, constantly adjust itself and change and try to like if like anything you're taking something that works, even with cannabis in general, like shit works like fire the first time. And then by the three days later, it doesn't do shit. You know what I mean? And those are the ones that you don't really want to stick with because for some reason they're just too simple, you know? And then you have other ones that are a little more complex and have more cannabinoids and hit more bells and whistles at that time. And for some reason has a better effect, you know, um, maybe just more THCV in it or something like that, which is, one, that's the thing, you're, you're kind of, you have a few THV, THCV kind of heavy strains, don't you? Or at least one? Yeah, we got some THCV stuff around, for sure, yep. And, <clears throat> and do they carry over um, as well? Do you notice that? Because that's one of those elusive cannabinoids that out there that was always, I think the difference between, I think the reason why people didn't understand why they liked outdoor weed compared to indoor weed sometimes, like that was always the, the separating factor because very hard to find indoor strains that have a lot of THCV uh, in them. Right. I mean, usually, maybe now it, through selection and not, but back in the day it was definitely like more of an outdoor kind of thing and it was like that. Try to explain it to people like uh, when you when you get a flash, kind of a kind of a weird high, like a, it kind of hits you like that. To me, that's like a right. THCV kind of reaction. I don't not, you know, I ain't no scientist. You definitely, get, <laughs> you definitely kind of get tuned to it once you understand what THCV is and then you smoke it. Mm -hmm. you, you, you definitely, like, become aware of it. And then that way, when you're smoking things in the future, you're like, oh, wait a minute, that has THCV. 
Yeah, when it kind of uh, reminds me, yeah, it, it kind of reminds me of like um, that w- weed that people have that they go, yeah, it's really you know, it may, like bright, like makes me wake up. You know what I mean? Kind of a speedy high almost compared to uh, uh, couch lock, you know, which was much simpler, just straight THC. But with that, yeah, I always have, always felt like it was a, and that's why I feel like when you have kind of weed that doesn't even look so nice, but it does something <laughs> you know what i mean you're like oh man that weed that ain't gonna do nothing and then you smoke it and you're like whoa really baked off of that one little pinner basically and then you get other stuff that it's all beauty and it looks like it's coming out of a bud porn magazine or something and then it doesn't do shit you know and you're like huh okay but yeah and i always felt like that might be the the, the one little missing element did you um so which strains are those ones that, with that is there any ones that are that so are dominant for example, I think one of the predominant ones that we see a lot of it in is Odie's Quan and Kush. Uh-huh. Um, we see a lot of the THCV coming sure it's from not, there. Sure it's not I hip- want to say it's coming from the time wreck. Sure it's not hippie cracks? It comes from the father. Sure it's not from hippie yeah, cracks? right. <laughs> Could be hippie cracks, quantum Kush, because I heard that's fire, dude. comes with powdery milk. Heard- <laughs> <laughs> and free russets. Free russets. Um, in every pack. No, but it's uh, <laughs> free, free, free russets every quarter. Um... No, with the quantum, we've seen that um, we've seen some really weird ratios in there. Um, I think the highest testing one female was like three point five percent THCV, and it had one percent CBC. So that's a little bit of a bonus in there. You get the CBC in there. So. Yeah, another elusive. So like another elusive one. one. Yeah, yeah. And so in the time wreck, it seems to there's seems to be a lot of little uh, anomalies that pop up. Um, you'll see a lot of the THCB. You'll see uh, the CBC in there, right? Yeah, it's a uh, it's, it's a hard one to lock down, you know. And it, it, once again, that just all comes back to science and a lot of hardcore analytical testing and selective breeding to isolate, you know, the THCB to make it more prominent enough. And you know, a lot of the cultivars that say they're high THCB are only like one percent or you know less than. I know that there's the Doug Farron out there that's like the highest testing one. But, you know, for an extractor, if you're trying to extract, you know, THCV out of a 1% flower, I mean, that's you have a lot of work ahead of you. It's a lot of material to process just to get one gram, you know. Sure. So if we, well, could, if we could, you know, get, get the, those numbers up and have them more prominent in progeny, I think that would be wonderful. I think there's a lot of uses with for THCV. There's a lot of stuff that we don't know. Well, the cool or part like of a diet drug, they're, they're really looking at that. The THCV could be used as a diet drug. Uh, sure. That's one thing that I know that farmers really looking at right now. Well, that's the thing is like right now, and it's also where you're going to have the the crazy. That's like where, where you're going to like cash out big in the long run because a certain when we when we get over the whole idea that THC and CBD is where it's all at, which is where everybody's at right now, and we start getting into those other uh, macro cannabinoid sort of profiles, things that are super finite, but at the same time, if you can quadruple a finite number it's it's starts to become extra sort of proportional you know what i mean like all of a sudden it's kind of like the the something that you only could get if you had a field of it you could end up with like an ounce of it now all of a sudden because you've managed to isolate and make it four times as much which isn't still nothing it's still like all of a sudden now the value on that's super high you know compared to like right thc and cbd are going to be like there's going to be so much of it, we're going to be building hempcrete out of it. You know what I mean? We'll be like, fuck, I got tons of that. You know what I mean? It's like, because everybody's going for the same thing. But uh, when you start talking about CBG, CBN, all these like other harder things that are a little bit more uh, super finite and, and they're going to have their own, they're going to have their own piece in this, uh, in this industry or whatever industry they're going to touch, you know? CBD 10 is the new one that, a lot, of, a lot of talks being talked about. Oh, tell me about, about you, what did you hear about that? I haven't even heard nothing about CBD-10. Uh, so it's, so basically it's, if you were to look at the molecule, it's the exact same molecule, but mirrored uh-huh. of opiates. And so they're saying now that it's being, it's, 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 it's going to be proven that cannabis actually is addictive because it has the CBD-10 in there. Oh, great. Let's, um, let's get that in. Let's get that news right. out there. Yeah, let's get that news out. Let's get into this stuff. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of spooky, you know, mm. especially when you have, 
you know. Uh, yeah, but that's not. You know, but that's the also like classification of CBD being considered and stuff like that. Where uh-huh. they're trying to make it schedule two. Right. If that happens, everybody who's hemp farming for CBD, they're done. You know, everything's going to switch over to pharma. Yeah. But you know, if, unfortunately, something like the CBD ten that that brings up a little bit more of that. Oh shit! You know. Well, that's there is something to fucking. That's kind of like, um, if you look at like, kratom or whatever, that also mirrors. Uh, but it's not addictive, you know what right. I mean? So there's, there, I think that's a little, maybe, but it'd be such an easy thing for media to jump all over. Be like, oh my God, you see, we knew it. We Absolutely. knew it. It's mirroring yep. addiction. It's like, well, mirroring addiction does not necessarily mean addiction. And it also, um, you know, could also mean it breaks addiction because that's usually what the case is with a lot of these things where like, like for instance, uh, the idea that stoners just sit around and eat donuts all day long and we're all fat and lazy, right? Well, it's like, no, actually, look at all your stoner friends. Most of them aren't. You know what I mean? Most of them are active. Most of them are, are like, burning, you know, high metabolism already to begin with because they're moving through the day a lot, doing a lot of work, doing whatever. And very few, actually, most of them are skinny. You know what I mean? And the weird part is, is what, I, what I tell people is, when I sit at a party with, like, 10 people, or not even a party, just hanging out, we're all smoking weed, very rarely does the conversation go to food, even though we're all smoking. Because none of us are, like, we're not, like, dude, we got to eat right now. But if you're, like, drinking, your people are, like, let's get a pizza now. Let's do this now. Like, it's all of a sudden, like, it's part of the, the protocol because that's, like, what you do. You drink and you eat. But because we always were, like, smoking in a parking lot or smoking somewhere that we weren't never, like... We didn't have food at accessible, you know what I mean? And even if you were at your own house, it was kind of like, fuck, I'm not making food for all these guys, you know what I mean? Fuck them, you know? So nobody would ever mention food. So food isn't really the number one thing for stoners. It very rarely is, you know, except for if you're Jason Pinsky or something like that and you want to do <laughs> long appetite. And, like, none of us did that, you know what I mean? None of the, Nobody was sitting around right. making big, giant weed meals every day because it's just we're all just busy. We're, in our, we're already in our bubble, you know, in our little hamster hamster wheel <laughs> but in general even like stoners and like not growers just regular old stoners not all fat you know what i mean and then so that but then uh, what my whole point the reason why i was going to bring this up is the fact that it's pretty easy to look at that and say oh well, wait a minute does it mean that cannabis makes you hungry but it could also just mean it turns you off your it could do the same thing the switch goes both ways it's like it makes you hungry or it absolutely actually sometimes doesn't make you hungry and when it doesn't make you hungry is when you don't notice it when it makes you hungry is when all of a sudden you're like dude i don't know what happened you know what i mean and that that feeling it's not every time because we smoke all day long every day I get munchies once every so often. I, well, every night at one o'clock in the morning. First, first of all, I can guarantee yeah. you. That. <laughs> like I'll late look at, at night. Uh, late at night, I'll go like, "Fuck!" Now I got the munchies, right? But during the day, not really at all. Unless you're hanging out with fucking Odie, then and that's a different story. <laughs> then you're forced. Right. Right? <laughs> Lunchtime. Uh, you know, I think I was going to say. I think uh, you know, cannabis has a that that stigma of, yeah, we're all stoners and we're fat, but I, I, I'm reflecting back to the panel that we did last month, Adam, with uh, Dr. Uma. Oh, yeah. And we discussed, you know, how, I thought that was a brilliant thing to combine both of our panels and our workshops. That yeah, was great. Um, and then, you know, we, we talked about how cannabis is the exit drug, and yep. I think that was great. I think that's a, uh, that's really what we do need to push. Mm-hmm. You know, we need to re-educate these people on that. Understanding that cannabis is a way out of an opioid, opi- uh, opioid epidemic. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, yeah, right, it's, uh, right now it's number public enemy number one, and it's finally being yep. recognized. But did you hear the lame-ass fucking thing that Trump came out with? Oh, my God. Hmm. Yeah, I heard that yesterday. It I was so that. sad. I can't even barely remember it. It was just like... Really bad for you. Don't do it. Wasn't that it? it was like oh, the op- oh, well, <laughs> it was like it was like you couldn't even like get that right. I was like, the fuck does that even mean? That's not even a complete sentence. First of all, and it's like it, it's dumb because it isn't all bad. It's actually medicine that you're supposed to be given to people in small amounts and not being abused. You know what I mean? It doesn't. It is medicine. It's leg- legally medicine. It's like technically it's not. It's not street drugs. So you can't say right. bad for you when you're talking about medicine, you know what I mean? Even though we know it's bad for people in excess, of course, and it's bad for society, and we know it's got its, its roots in heroin and it's, it's evil in that sense, but at the same time, for his stupid asinine statement to come up with that, I was like, that's your fucking idea of, like, who, <laughs> like, that is the worst. Even just say no made more sense. But, of course, that was aimed towards 
uh, and it should have just been, it should just be like be fucking smart basically about it. You know what I mean? And like wake up everybody and you know cut off all the people who don't need oxycontin. It's fucking seven thousand pills a month, <laughs> obviously. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, that's it's all pill mills and all that bullshit. You know so. Uh, don't get me going. Yep. <laughs> but no, it is <laughs> it is uh, uh, interesting, especially where you guys are at. Isn't it kind of like, isn't Oregon going nuts right now with fucking like all of a sudden? Don't they want to? Is it true they want to legalize all drugs there? Is that really true? Yeah. So they they decriminalized all hard drugs here in Oregon, just mm-hmm. like uh, you know what Prague and yep. some of these other countries just trying to take suit and then trying to <clears throat> trying to treat people rather than putting them in jail and i think that's great i mean if of course if you can give these kids these days you know treatment rather than giving them a, a felony that's going to fuck them up for the rest of their life you know absolutely all day long enjoy it and do what it takes and i'm surprised it t- took this long uh you know 15 years ago here in oregon if you got busted with weed or growing or something it was it was very likely your ca- your case would get thrown out you would never make it to the courtroom because yeah. there were the lines were so long with heroin and you know all these hard drug cases that you know we 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 was, we was just a joke so huh. it's yeah, been well, like that for a long time and it's a good thing to see here man so you know hopefully it's for the better and <clears throat> but it is but it is also attracting like a lot of homeless and kind of craziness and like parking on the side of the road and camp open camping isn't that camping legal there camping like in the city limits and all that kind of shit yeah, it's, yeah, these, yeah. You can park your RV on the street, and yeah. as long as you're moving it every couple of days, you're pretty much just camping. So. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely Colorado's way yeah. more upside. I think on all this kind of shit, that's oh, for yeah. sure. Uh, yeah, because I noticed that when I was there, just the, the little bit that I got to manage to get out away from the show, and I was like, "Damn, people just parking up here." And uh, Sasquatch was like, "Yep, <laughs> it gets kind of crazy down here." And he was just making it. And it he does. was. And he told yeah. me. He told me a little bit about what was happening. So. Um, yeah, and living in Holland, it was the same thing. I mean, they basically, de- you know, decrimmed in a way. They didn't really. It got wor- later on. It got. It did get. <laughs> it did end up getting worse there, uh, mostly because of heroin and stuff. But, but it was like when I first moved there, you had to like, like literally coming out of Central Station, it was just like bodies everywhere, like people just laying around, and you had to step over the junkies to get to your bus. You know what I mean? It was like really like nuts. It was so out of control. But then Switzerland was like. 10 times worse like you couldn't even imagine because they were just that they took over whole areas you know what i mean it was kind of like whoa this is nuts so for me that was always a good indicator of a good way to not get the next generation involved ah i think we have a call (laughs) boom snow high i think is coming in oh yeah yo yo welcome to the adam dunn show is this snow high Hey, yes, it is. How are you doing, Adam? I'm good. I'm good. I got um, Sonny still on the line, so it's a, it's a three-way at the moment. So we'll hey, do. Sonny. How's it going, Snow? Oh, it's going, man. It's going good. <laughs> hey, good, good. So it's good to get you on the show. We had uh, a bunch of requests from listeners. They wanted to get you back on here. And, uh, yeah, we thought it would be a little crossover with, with Sonny's Never Hurts. So how's... Uh, <laughs> And then we also had a, we had last week we did a Purple Urkel show and so it was kind of like we, we we realized there wasn't a lot of breeding talk going on because we pretty much found out it was just you know handed down exactly like it was and maintained properly and kind of went from that point on whereas you got lots going on I think and Sunny and also um, so we kind of wanted nice. wanted That's to what- yeah wanted to talk about any first off out of the gate any purple stuff just because that could be like Especially if there's any Urkel crosses, that would be interesting because it's nice to see where right. they're Right. Well, yeah, I've done some Urkel crosses for sure. Um, back in, like, the 1990s, like, 97, 98, there was some, well, a, lot, a lot of purple uh, growing going on in Mendocino. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's when the purple craze started happening. Got, it started getting spread around. But, I mean, there was purple stuff going in Humboldt since, like, 1960s, 1970s. Sure. Uh, there was the uh, Humboldt Purple Star going on. That was popular from the 70s to 80s. And then there was, uh, like, some Mendocino Purple varieties. And right now, I, I can't remember the crosses, but there was some old stuff going on near the town of Mendocino, which is right on the coast. And there's, like, a little community of hippies that were there, like beatniks that wa- turned to hippies. And that was from the 50s to 60s. Mm-hmm. And those guys were bringing up weed from Mexico, the old purple varieties, 
and uh, breeding it in. And that area was called Guayala. I think that's how you pronounce it. Right. So a lot hmm. of early purple stuff was going on there, but it was like early Mexicans, you know. Right. And they had like, uh, you know, some really nice hazy looking stuff. So it looked like purple haze, you know, what a, pe- a, pe- a person like relates to like purple haze being sure. all was it sativa, a, narrow, and was there like any zacatas uh, purple in there? Because there was those were kind of ones that kind of tended to go purple. I thought as a sort of land race Mexicans. Sure. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the stuff that was what people think is Zacatecas purple, Zacatecas. the Torreon violet. Uh huh. Yeah, that's that's kind of like the uh, central Mexican areas, and it also went to the coast down to Michoacan and Guerrero. Gotcha. Um, so those, yeah, they did turn purple, and a lot of stuff, even even from like the 60s, 70s, 80s, even 50s, even um, turned different colors from purples and reds. You know, different shades in between there, and then at like mid 80s, things start changing to like more the greens um, as more like hybrids started coming in, um, and then they they lost a lot during the Paraquat Springs in the late 1970s. Hmm. So a lot of the, the varieties that were like very prevalent were lost because people down Mexico lost their vegetable crops. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the whole idea was to spray and try to eradicate the, uh, the weed, but they were actually killing off a lot of the, like, the crops for food. Sure. But um, they did eradicate a lot of varieties that were around. Yeah, they, got, they succeeded in something great. <laughs> great back in the day, you know. Um, so yeah, right. it sounds like... Uh, so you have a lot of uh, land race kind of in your in your lines. Uh, what what's what's your favorite as far as like back like what's your backbone that you kind of go back to every time or is there is there any is there any like that? Um, I mean the the purple Colombians turn uh, nice colors and some of the Mexicans that I have uh, they got the purple traits and I'm trying to bring those back mm-hmm. for as as far as like purple traits the hybrids I mean that I've been able to work with they really come out with like, um, you know, it's purple traits that bleed purple and a lot of the, the stuff that bleeds purple, like you've heard of the Hawaiian blood. Yeah. Uh, those derive from like Mexican varieties huh. and, um, I've seen them prevalent in like Oaxaca, Michoacan sure. and they, they can bleed purple, black, um, or red. Right. And you'll see that in the stems too, the stems and the petioles, which is like where the main uh, stem turns into like a little leaflet yeah, kinda, into the regular leaf for right. people that don't know. Sure. And that actually has a little color in it. It turns colors. Right. Yeah, it's like when you're making bubble hash too and you get all the color coming off of those things. Sometimes it's like super nice fuchsia, you know, and then they get those other ones that are right. a little more dark and don't necessarily translate as well. Um, okay, well, that's cool. So, uh, But I was uh, actually kind of even con- uh, talking outside of just the purple lines. What, 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 what else... Um, would you consider like backbone to snow high sort of success or you're kind of, cause everybody kind of, I feel like every seed company well, should have like kind of one stellar thing that they, everyone knows them from. Oh man. Well, honestly what I've been doing is preservation for years. So I haven't been really working on the really kick-ass lines, but mm-hmm. I've been making those along the lines while I've been doing preservation. <laughs> nice. Um, I mean, I mean, I've got Hawaiian lines that are pretty kick-ass that uh, I think are really high quality. Um, but um, I've got Blazing Dragon, which is uh, Maui Waui from like 1976. Wow. Um, with a Burmese male. Um, the Burmese actually add some size, resin, and it kind of lets the, um, the Maui Waui kind of take over, but it just adds a little bit to it and shortens the flower time. But the, the Maui Waui isn't like really long flowering anyway. Uh-huh. So it kind of is pretty nice stuff. And then some of the old heads that have been able to grow out the Blazing Dragon have really liked it. I have some friends that were like living in Hawaii for long periods of time. And, you know, they have their parents like brotherhood, uh, you know, mm-hmm. uh, family members. So they have really enjoyed uh, the Blazing Dragon, and that's uh, Mao Wowie Burmese. But um, how, how yeah, many weeks is I that? Mean, like, how many weeks is that running about? Uh, Sixteen to eighteen. Right. It's not too bad. Yeah. No. And well, some phenotypes I mean, could go longer, but sure. I mean, yeah, some. But Mao Wowie's in a super long flowering. Right. Super long. And is it? Um, so it's so it's got more of a classic kind of thinner thinner leaf and and stacks up these longer longer buds and things. Exactly. Yeah, and then there's some of the little spears that'll produce too. But if the Burmese actually produce really long spears, mm-hmm. um, but the the Mao Wowie side is kind of smaller little spears. Gotcha. But, so you get a a good variance between the two. Yeah, I mean back in the day when I was younger and uh, I got to get any kind of decent Hawaiian, it was like I think. About 1986 or something like that, and it was, 
you know, from my uncle getting it sent from a friend and he was canning it up and having it sent to him. And I just remember like my grandmother opened up cause she thought it was a coffee for her. <laughs> and so she came in and was like, <laughs> opened it up. And my uncle was like, mm, kind of like snatched it out of her hand. You know what I mean? And it was like one of those right. deals. And I was like, what is that? You know? And he's like, showed it to me. And I remember it being real, like literally like little waves. You know what I mean? It was really, really cool looking weed compared to, it wasn't like nodules of little indica buds or anything like that or even and it wasn't in i couldn't tell about spears because it was in a can so it was i could only could tell right what i could tell but it was a beautiful it had some 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 different colors in it but it was just the wavy pattern that tripped me out the most because i remember like you know i was only at, at that time i was about 15 so it was barely conscious of what was going on but at the same time i remembered like stuck in my head forever like because it was Hawaiian and it looked like waves, it was like, well, that's about as symbolic as easy as he can remember, you know. But um, oh, for sure, no idea. I mean, and, and I believe it was Kauai Electric at the time, but I'm not 100 percent sure. So nice. Do you have any experience with that strain? Uh, I do, but it, it's the hybrid form. But I, you know, trying to get some um, uh, get some of the real Kauai mm-hmm. Electric uh, mm-hmm. again. Um, I got some Kona Gold uh, that I'm going to be trying to pop here soon from some old lines. Right. Um, I also got, um, but I did the Kauai Electric with my buddy's done it with the uh, M10 Afghani from uh, Super uh, Sativa Seed Company. Okay, yeah, and it's cool. pretty nice. Produces some big buds. Yeah. Right. Uh, but the pure Kauai Electric, no, I haven't got to try that pure yet. Uh, yeah, but I've had yeah. it in hybrid form. It's pretty nice. Yeah, that was my mission back in the day. And it was kind of like, I got close, but not really. It was like kind of like... You know, I thought I, I thought I'd found it. Like, I was like, yes, this is it. You know, and then a guy was like, oh, telling me like it was like all of a sudden it was like, no, this is something from Sensi Seeds. And I was like, great, I, I work there. You know, I was like, that's not really what I came here for. I didn't come here to get <laughs> Sensi Seeds. Like, fuck. You know, I was like, right. But well, uh, well, well, if I get a hold of that, um, I'll let you know. Yeah, no, that's, try some that's, that. that's definitely one of those ones because uh, I had a lot of friends from Kauai, and that was always like there. You know, that's like the. The, the legend, you know, as I, of course everybody comes in. Whenever right. I, whenever I visit there, there are people I come in and telling me about. It. I go, keep people keep telling me about it, but I want to see. I need to see some of that. Um, so, so, what's your background? Are you are you are you where, where like originally, like your family and stuff? Where are you from? I'm from Northern California. I was uh, born and raised in Northern California. Basically, we're between wine country and Humboldt. So, uh, my my grandparents are from Mendocino. They were born there. And um, my family's had uh, homesteaded property pretty close to um, that area between the counties of Sonoma, uh, Lake, mm-hmm. and Mendocino. So we're right on the border there. Right. I don't want to say exactly where because no, of I course. don't want everybody knocking on my door. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> no, they got you. <laughs> we've had the property in our uh, family since 1883. Wow. Um, we were the first people to purchase the land um, when it became available. Huh. Uh, we paid for it in gold. And then I uh, had a family member that was um, a Civil War um, soldier. And during the Great Depression, we were able to keep the property when everybody else lost theirs with cool. that Civil War pension. That's so, crazy. And, uh, and uh, this, yeah, piece of so pro- this piece of property, is it um, has w- good water on it? Cause that's yeah, we've got water rights. So we got uh, water running through it. Um, it's uh, over 400 acres, so we got a good amount of property there. It's perfect climate for growing cannabis. Um, you know, it doesn't freeze very often, and we don't get a lot of moisture that, like it does in Humboldt. You get hardly any mold issues at all. Yeah. Uh, now, we don't get any mold issues where we're at, but if you're like over the line yeah. into uh, like Medicina or Sonoma, you get a lot of moisture and mold issues, yeah. which we don't have. Right, that's always an issue. Um, so, so basically, born into it, obviously, which sounds awesome. And I, I, so, I mean, we had uh, I have friends from Big Sur, and I think this is their last year because of right. all the all the stuff going on. They're just like they have to throw in the towel. They say. they're just like you know they've been here for forty years or something, and it's <clears throat> it's a little too much for them because they're all in their seventies now. Right. So, so they're like got to spend their last few years not dealing with uh, broken down bridges and <laughs> landslides and shit. Oh, yeah. It's, it's been difficult. And the fires, the fires have been cr- and, you know, crazy. And the roads getting in and out has been, you know, non-existent. So, <laughs> yeah, it must be pretty tough there. Yeah, that's that's uh, something it's like people have always dealt with the craziest stuff. And when it was cannabis growers, you know, it's like just added pressure, you know, considering they 
when there's a for, when there's a fire for everybody else it's bad news but for people who are growing it's like you know obviously devastating when they can't move nothing and 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 they can't get caught you know what i mean now it, so it's like the the amount of oh, yeah. the amount of hoops people had to jump jump through just to survive to get to the point where you know now it's legal but <laughs> they can't capitalize on it because of the the you know the, the situation where it's at um right so when you get all these land races now, do you travel to the spots yourself, or you kind of get people kind of collecting for you, or is, how, how does it go from well, like recent back stuff? in the day? Well, back in the day, I used to do a lot of traveling. I left uh, and joined the military, so I got to go and uh, travel the world. So when I was eighteen, nineteen, um, I was a hospital corpsman in the Navy and also the Marines. So I got to travel over 26 different countries and i was actually back then i was uh, searching for psychedelics <laughs> so i was going out and uh, trying to collect and, and sample all the different types of things that the world has to offer and um i got to see that the, the cannabis that was grown in northern california was pretty damn good comparative uh to the stuff i used to get around the world but mm -hmm. there was certain types of weed when you you got it from certain regions of the world that had a certain quality that were um something that you'd want like you'd get uh Thai weed, which was nice and sweet. It looked like kind of shitty, but it would smoke so good and it had such a great effect. So if you're growing, you know, you're getting Thai weed and you're smoking that, and you get like a, a indica, like White Widow, mm -hmm. and the, the Thai weed beats it, you know, every time. Right. So it's just a great high, and you're always searching after those highs. So when I got back after traveling the world, and, and I lived out of the country for a couple of years um, in Italy, I lived on a little teeny island for three years. Um, so when I finally came back, um, you know, I brought some seeds with me that I got in different travels uh, from everywhere, from Thailand to Indonesia, um, and uh, I was able to grow some of those out. And I did have connections with my friends that I've met from different places, mm -hmm. and uh, they've been able to send me seeds. Um, and, you know, I've been able to gather collections from different parts of the world. So I have friends in different places like Africa and um, Southeast Asia. I don't want to, like, say yeah, yeah, specifics, course. but they, they, they sent me... Um, very good land races to try to preserve hmm. and to do something with them because even in their um, areas they're able to get a little bit of it but it's even rapidly diminishing at those times so right. i've been lucky to get some friends and and, and gather them that way as well sure and, and, then, and that's the thing too is like uh i used to get a lot of stuff kind of delivered to me via people just traveling and you know didn't even ask them to do it but it was just like they're coming through amsterdam they'd be like oh yeah here i just here's a a photo of the plant in you know Afghanistan, and here's the seeds, and here's a photo of the hash made I made from it next to a lighter, so you can see that you know they had it all figured out, so they could show me, and I go right, okay, right, cool, you know the uh, nice. and some stuff I could you know like I totally didn't have like a, there was a Mor I had a ton of Moroccan shit, which now is actually really interesting, you know what I mean? But back in the day. In, in Amsterdam, I'd be yeah, like, yeah. I don't know, like, I'm not going to do anything <laughs> with this, you know what I mean? I doubt I'm going to do anything with this, but now I took it with me here, and now I'm like, hey, you know, actually, even though I know they're not going to be vigorous plants by any means, they're going to be scrubby, small things, just to see if there's a way to get the some of the terpenes that are familiar to me. But right. The problem is most, the quality. Of the, most of the problem is that those those kind of things, it's the process more than the product that you recognize, you know, because it's like literally like dirt from the dirt floor in your fucking hash and you know there's stuff in there that like has nothing to do with the hash that it's coming from so in a way i kind of feel like without doing it in that dirt floor of that place in morocco you're never going to get that same moroccan flavor you know what i mean that it, <laughs> it's kind of like right right it's a lot of terroir uh situations there you know what i mean it's, it's well, epic just like the moroccan stuff you're getting all those weird uh, dust storms from Spain and all over the place. You, you're yeah. getting this cross-pollination of all kinds of craziness. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. and without growing it right there, you're not going to get that flavor. So For sure. And, and it's so hard to, like, capture those things. But I have seen, you know, I've seen, like, uh, Frenchie kind of pull off some pretty decent, close to the original flavor style, like for, you know, Temple Ball or or something like that. But, right. but for the most part, it's a lot of times, uh, it's, you know, when you, like, had that stuff tested, it was maybe 30 percent thc and we're growing shit that's that that strong you know what i mean so it's kind of like you know it's not about the strength it's always about the the combination of the, the quality the, yeah and everything else a lot a lot of well yeah a ton of turp stuff just because it's 
again, those things that people like, they just have to smell it and they're already happy because they're like, yeah, that's what it's supposed to smell like. You know what I mean? They don't want to smell anything else. It's kind of like, right. kind of like OG people. You know, they're like, if it doesn't smell like OG, they get all confused, sure. get a confused look on the face. They're not sure what's going on. Is that weed? Is there something going on? <laughs> what, what, they get all weird. Like, oh, man. Yeah, that's, yeah, that that's, that's swag, man. I'm not smoking that. <laughs> that ain't no OG. You know what I mean? You're like, oh, my God. Yeah, it's an unfortunate. But uh, so are any other your family members still helping you out, or is it kind of like uh, you're taking it on yourself? Or you No, guys... my, uh, myself, right now, I, I've been sick for six years. I got uh, so I came I went on vacation for a collection trip in 2012, and I got sick um, all the way back. I don't know if I ate contaminated fish. Um, from It's a neurotoxin from, like, eating the fish in the Gulf of Mexico. But I was in the Yucatan collecting some, you know, going around from uh, Tulum all the way down to Cancun, going just making stops trying to find weed. Uh-huh. Um, but on the way back, I got sick. And it triggered off a bunch of things going on with my body. So uh, for the last six years, I've been trying to get better. And for, like, two years, I couldn't even really walk. Um, had problems with vision. I got actually two pituitary brain tumors in my uh, brain that I need to get checked out periodically to see if it's growing. Hmm. Um, but i uh, been trying to get better the last uh, six years, so I uh, was working a, a full-time job as, as well as some other stuff on top of everything. Uh, so right now I've just uh, been concentrating on getting better. And uh, even this last year, or the last couple of years, I've been slowly not doing as much growing, and I've been working on just some breeding but I was going full force for years, and I've had to slow down considerably because of everything. But uh, hopefully, um, I'm going to be able to grow um, and breed year round here. Now that I got a new place, mm-hmm. so um, we'll be back to getting some actual good breeding, getting down to basics, and uh, and doing some good jobs. Yeah, no, it's uh, I mean it's extra hard, of course. Uh, when when you know the, the thing is growing growing cannabis is a, is a 24 hour a day job and and like breeding is even more because you're thinking like ahead or you're trying to like time things right and you're it's it's definitely not a it's not a plug and play you know what I mean you have to kind of man the ship all no. the time so uh, so you have somebody like assisting you pretty much uh, main what I have uh, I've had two friends and I've had family um, the last few years especially when I haven't been well enough to, to do um, the traveling. I've got greenhouses going up north. I've always done my breeding outdoors for the most part, do selections indoors and do my breeding outdoors mm-hmm. um, in greenhouses or full outdoors. So I, I either do the breeding and then we bring them to a, uh, a place to finish off where we do all the breeding in one area. Right, that's cool. And, and you know, separate type of projects. But I have uh, two partners. My main partners are two of my oldest friends. And then I have my family helping me out uh, doing the watering and stuff. So it helps out, and I don't have to do all the work. So it's, it's been truly uh, – <laughs> I can't do it by myself for sure. Right. Well, it's good to um, grow them outdoors like that too in greenhouse situations just because you can see the expressions fully in whatever you're breeding instead of kind of like, you know, I think indoors – in, indoor, Well, and yeah, indoors are rough because you can do that, but it's at the same time you don't know if you're the, the culprit or is it, the, is it you or is it the genetics, whereas you put it outdoors – and it's pretty much like you can't blame the sun, you know what I mean? You can't blame the way, you know, right. you, everything else should be easy enough to dial in. Whereas indoors, it's like, yeah, what's the, how old are your bulbs? And, you know, did you properly space it? And did you, you know, compensate for the the plant next door that's shading it out? You know what I mean? Whereas... Uh, right, right. Outdoor, Nutrients over watering or whatever the hell. Yeah, and, you know, everything's static. Whereas outdoors, you know, it's like, you know, the... As long as you're in built built your greenhouse in the right spot, you know, I mean, you didn't fuck up totally right out of the gate. Like, oh shit, I put it in a big cloudy spot. That's not a great idea. But as long as right. you like, you know, position your, in the way. positioned your greenhouse properly and you have, you know, decent weather, it's the seeds completely then respond by, you know, expressing themselves completely. And then it's great to get like a six foot or a ten foot or a nine foot or whatever size plant the plant's going to end up being, just because that's what it does. You know, compared to like. Right. Tr- trying to grow it in a twenty-gallon container. So how big? So when you grow in these greenhouses, are you growing in like smart pots or uh, beds? You know, or? I don't like smart pots because the smart pots a lot of times they don't use up all the size of the the, the soil. Mm. So you end up using a lot of you know losing a lot of soil. So I like to repot and then um, to a certain point and um, 
I either bury it back down into the ground after a certain point, mm-hmm. or I continue to grow them in, in pots. Okay. And I can control size by repotting and making them use up all the soil. Uh-huh. Um, so if I'm doing breeding, I can keep them to the sizes I like, um, depending on how large the greenhouse is or how large I want to get the plants. Yeah. Um, so I could actually, if I'm doing a breeding project and I got a lot of plants, I can make them smaller, um, but sure. make them produce enough, uh, floral, you know, um, density that I'm able to do what I need to do. Yeah. Um, but if I'm trying to you know, grow them out for production, they're going to be full sun in the ground. Nice. Um, but we can make, you know, 10 feet, uh, wide plants, you know, eight to 14 feet high if we need to. But for the most part, they're like seven to nine feet tall if you're growing outdoors for production but if we're doing like breeding projects I like to keep them smaller mm-hmm. uh, they can get about six to nine feet but um you know three to seven feet are typical for breeding plants yeah yeah no it's, I, I mean it's all about the numbers at that point you have to really like put out enough to be able to get an idea of what's happening and or be able to just select out because it's like one out of five ain't a great selection, is it? It's like, okay, well, that was a great selection. You know? But if you have right. to put out 100 or a couple hundred and then whittle it down to the top 100, let's say, yeah, you know, that's that's kind of well, my yeah. usual way. I usually grow a couple hundred, and, you know, you're, you're doing a lot of, uh, you know, seeds. You're starting a lot of seeds. Like for me, I, I take a lot of seeds that are maybe old. So you, you grow out like 300 of them, mm-hmm. and maybe about 120 will grow. And yeah. then there might be something that you want to whittle those away because of whatever issues, you know, there were poor uh, plants to begin with sure. um, or whatever here. the reason might be. And then you might have to grow another hundred uh, mm-hmm. plants to go along with it or add a couple more hundred. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've, you know, maybe popped 600 seeds in one season just because I needed more plant numbers uh, to, to get up to what I need for selections. Or yeah. I needed more plants to, to fill in a space that maybe these plants didn't do so well or they didn't germinate at all, and I need to kind of think of uh, something else to go in its place. So with the with the land race stuff that you're doing, how is it with timing though? Since you got, I mean, I guess if you have four, if you have really long 14s and 16 weekers, and you're in a greenhouse, because the thing is, what I what I find is difficult is trying to time things where you're doing too many different things in the same area, just because of feeding schedules and. Every, I mean, it right. kind of gets an overlap sometimes. How do you uh, do? You, do you know? How do I figure that out? Yeah. How do you figure? <laughs> how do you figure out the finishing yeah. times? Mostly, I'd say. Well, I mean, on some plants, you kind of get an idea. So, like Colombians ties, they'll be longer flowering. Uh, those will be, you know, if you're growing indoors, um, they could be twenty to twenty-four weeks. If you're growing outdoors, they could finish in December or they could finish in January or February. Um, so those are Colombians. I mean, they have predetermined genetic markers, Mm -hmm. so you can veg for 60 to 90 days from seed and then from veg, uh, then you can start flowering and that could be four months, you know? Yeah. Would you even Uh, want to grow that? Would would you want to grow it that long even, or would you want to just flip it early and try to create a more manageable? Um, Well, it, it depends. Like, uh, if you're growing, um, different plants and you, you got everything that's going to be flowering and finishing at a certain time. That doesn't bother you. You want to you want to wait it out because if you can harvest it a little earlier, you're not going to see all the expressions. You're not going to see the colors. Mm. You think can turn on, like turn on full on reds, um, and shades of purples, and all these beautiful colors. That sometimes if you can you know, manipulate it, you're not going to see these colors come out because you kind of, you know, you're manipulating the the schedule with the light schedule. But mm. if you give it enough time, you're really going to see these colors get pronounced and the the quality of the flowers. Um, mm. You know, it, they get a little bit better. Right. Um, but also, if you got Mexicans that take, you know, 16 to 18 weeks, and then you got some Colombians that are 20 to 24, um, you know, you can space in between so you're not harvesting all at the same time. Sure. So well, you yeah. can kind of time things by figuring out when they flower and when they finish. And when you're harvesting, do you do, um, you, do you trim on the site, or do you, like, uh, take everything off and dry it and then work from dry material? Um, it depends. Um, sometimes I take whole plants or I take long branches. Uh, I take off the big fan leaves off the majority of it, but I leave a lot of the smaller floral leaves on there to kind of protect the flowers. Mm-hmm. And if you can hang them up as a large plant, you'll do that. But if you're going to dry them, um, you know, you want to do it as manageable as possible. And sometimes the only way to do that is to take, you know, larger limbs and trimming off the fan leaves and hanging them up. But um, if you can do a whole plant, that's kind of 
ideal. Sure. Just for um, spacing and stuff, of course, because once you've got a, film, yeah. a whole bunch of them, I'm sure it must, be, it must be the Achilles heel for a lot of people when they realize they have so much to dry and it's yeah. such a limited amount of space sometimes. But uh, a cool thing that I've been doing lately for if you if you're doing breeding, and um, you, you want to have you know, the problem is if you're seeding up something, it's so seeded that you really can't try the weed. It's almost you know useless. So I've been taking the the seeds and the the buds that are already green when it's finished. I've been tumbling it uh, with dry ice and shaking it out um, just after I harvest it. And I've been able to shake out the resins and make, um, you know, hash from it, like a live resin hash uh, Mm -hmm. from the buds. And then the dry ice kind of cleans the seeds, and I can just collect those seeds. It makes it uh, uh, a cool thing at harvest. Yeah. Sure. Instead of drying it and then getting some buds that look cool, but then you waste it. So you don't get to really try the weed. Right. Yeah, no, it it is the... uh, uh, I kind of have fun doing it, of course, but it is also crazy because when you're just breaking up all your seeded weed and you're just crushing it up and kind of running it through and collecting your seeds and then eventually you take to, you know do using the material for whatever it's already kind of like knocked down so many notches that you're just like not you can't do the same thing you do when you're like just producing flour or producing no. r- resin to just produce resin you know what i mean like those two things right no, the, it's different the minute you seed it it's like it's like everything's in a different direction you know the plant's just you're 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 like I always like to let everything get to the point where the tips are burning on them almost like they're just overdone, you know, like way mm-hmm. overdone looking. For sure, parts. then you see it's a nice and stained, yeah. Yeah, and then everything's happening, and otherwise, so you always know it. You see it. You see it. It's right there, but that just kind of goes away in front of you. You're like, oh man, well, well, can't do it. So yeah, it's uh, it is one well, of the. I have a question. Uh huh. I, I I have a question for you. So, you know, a lot of people always ask about germinating old seeds. And since you work mm-hmm. with a lot of older stock, do you have any tips for anybody here on, you know, what are your steps for germinating, you know, seeds that are 10 plus years older? Yeah. Um, what, that, what gives you a that's success? a great question. <laughs> that's a great question, Sonny. Um, I have several methods, and uh, sometimes some are better than others. 10 years isn't that bad. 10 years, it doesn't even seem that right. old to me. Mm-hmm. Because I've <laughs> I tried to germ 30 and 40 year old seeds that won't germ at all, or sometimes you get a few. Um, I've tried everything from, you know, freezing them and then germinating them right away mm-hmm. to doing the uh, jabilic acid. Um, sometimes uh, that can work, but you can overdose the jabilic acid or use too much. I wouldn't say overdose is a good word. Um, using too much. So if you don't use enough, it's almost not. Work worth the use of it, and you could like damage the seeds. If you too, put too much, it can kill the seeds. So it's almost not a good method. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've heard everything then, from soaking the beans in uh, pinto, uh, like uh, taking like pinto beans, yeah. like uh, refried beans from the seeds, and soaking the water, and then soaking the seeds in that. Yeah. Uh, but honestly, a lot of the methods I've tried were just uh, you know paper towel method. Um, within like eight to twelve hours picking open the seed um, and basically uh, taking a fingernail and using lateral pressure to open up the embryos and then basically um, putting the, uh, the seed in the soil, uh, something that's not too overly strong, and then basically nursing them with maybe um, a solution of uh, vitamins, like a vitamin solution with, what is that, uh, Super Thrive. You can use a couple of drops of Super Thrive with the water solution and kind of nurse it along. But I usually take a, like a soil tray and I do two parts where it's kind of like a, you can use like a light wire on top, but then the bottom portion of the trays where they're like starter trays, like the, the cardboard type, mm-hmm. they can just peel away. Uh-huh. I like using those because uh, when you have a tap root in the bottom, you can just rip them away and they don't really damage the tap roots. Uh, if that doesn't make sense. But I do half and half soil, like you can use a uh, ocean forest or a happy frog for most people that can't get other soils and then on the top half layer you can use like a lighter soil like a uh, light wire which is you know a little bit lighter not so much nutrient dense and you can set the so- uh, seed um, on its side and by using the putting the seed on its side or the embryo on its side uh, the magnetic um, portions of the earth will pull the taproot downward 
so you don't really need to point the taproot in any direction. It'll do it by itself. And you can kind of lightly dust it with a little bit of the soil that's on top. You don't need to bury the, soil, the, the seed. And by leaving it in, under natural light, you can actually get the seeds to do well. The, the thing I think people mess around with is uh, moving the seeds around too much um, or um, using the light, the moon schedule. I think a lot of people try to germinate seeds on the full moon. I think the best time to do it is maybe right. a week to 10 days before then. So the, the magnetism of the moon is kind of helping along, mm-hmm. not when it starts waning. Right. That um, makes sense. But those are, those are a couple of methods that I've used. Um, I, I do have a germination tutorial that I've written and posted online for people. Um, it's on uh, geneticsgenius.com, and it just shows people from, you know, step one to, to end how to germinate seeds. And you can do those from new seeds, too, because I've had some land race seeds that I've uh, created from Colombians that had a really hard shell like a, Colum- like a pistachio. Right. And they're healthy seeds, but they won't germinate unless you crack them open. So, right. you know, people just let them drown, you know, and these are healthy seeds. And if you use a lateral pressure and crack them open, you'll get a lot more uh, seed germination success than you normally wouldn't. Right. Yeah, no, it's definitely, uh, I mean, it's crazy, too, when you look at photos of just 100 different kinds of seeds. And there's, you know, every type in the world. And they're just, like, round and cantaloupe-shaped and flat. And some of them split real easy. And some of them are really hard to to crack, for sure, just out of the gate. Right. And uh, people are always scared with seeds, too, like to touch them and do anything. But, I mean, sometimes you just have to. Right. You do have to get in there and give them a little life support. But, and it's like sometimes it's, it's classic, too, because those are the ones you always track the easiest because whatever was the runt or the one you had to use a little thing to hold it up or whatever it is, those are always the ones that you, you kind of, like, catch at the end. And it, more times than not, you see they, bomb. they really fucking come through because they like, had such a rough beginning, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden they powered through and... Sometimes they really, like, overtake the other ones. And that's why you got to be, you know, especially when you got stuff that's very rare and old, uh, you know, got to try to make every, sure. every, every single thing work. Yeah, seltzer water was another one that people told me back in the day, which is, like, you know, keep, like, if you ever get that little extra CO2 or whatever, it doesn't really mean to did anything. But usually, like, uh, right. that seed, you know, it works really well. well what I noticed is uh, Microblife's uh, root dip. You make, like, a... Um, thing of that is it's microbial but it's uh, so awesome as far as like uh beneficial bacteria yeah uh, just right out of the gate are just yeah it's just right out of the gate and the thing is it's like uh any seeds you kind of got to like it, test them in the water anyway to see if they float and see what's going on if they all float right. you know your, your chances are pretty slim you know what i mean if they all sink you're got oh, i got a good chance you know something's going to happen so i always like to give them that that initial either 12 hours soak or even 24 hours depending how they do and sometimes they'll crack right in the first day you know i mean you'll see them in the in the glass cracking so you're like all right for sure we got a winner you know i mean guarantee at that point but uh yeah Yeah. old seeds i've had the oldest one i've done recently was an 82 and i had uh, 12 and i got four out of 12 all males (laughs) so i was like i was like really great (laughs) and i was like that's cool i got all males i selected one male out of it but uh, and it was a pr- an '82 Kentucky Skunk that one of the listeners actually got to me nice. at the last Adzi, and so it was a, you know, it was cool to me because it was before skunk was a thing, so it means it had to smell like a skunk. Right. I mean, there's no way it didn't smell like a skunk, or else they wouldn't have called it a <clears throat> skunk, you know. So, and Kentucky's definitely. Oh not, yeah, I remember those old skunks. Right. So I'm hoping that something comes out. I got the first round of seeds I made from some you know test run. See how that goes. So I got a bunch of things. We could always out. reverse those males to see what it looks like, you know, since that's all you have. Sure. But, yeah. you know, that, that'd be like, I'm not a really, I'm not a, I, I don't mean, do feminizing typically, but if you have, that's all you have, uh-huh. you could probably reverse it just to look and, and preserve the line that way. Sure. Um, yeah, at least know, see if right. it's got resin going on or if it smells like it really should. Um, but it's one of those, I took the one that was the stinkiest of them, the least, hemp, the least hempy, most stinky, but it's also weird too because you're thinking 1982 in your mind, you know, so you're like, looking at it from a different look, you know, like it's, uh, right. is it going to be the one that looks all like hempy and weird? Or is it going to be that going to be the magic one? Or is it going to be the one that actually, and then there was one that was like more modern structure, but didn't smell so much. And then I just went for the stinky 
prehistoric looking one. It was like it looked kind of weird and prehistoric. I was like, yeah, that's that's the that's the one I'm going for. You know what I mean? Stinky prehistoric plant compared to more right. more of a modern look. But there was definitely variables all the way through. I had f- four different males, you know. So it was a it was, wow. a, it was a weird one. Um, what do you got going on now, Snow? As far as like projects that are like oh, super man. hot and uh, you're well, stable. We're coming this out with... year was a little odd, but uh, I'm doing some wines. I've got <clears throat> some stuff from a place north of South Korea. Oh, wow. um, I've got some stuff from <laughs> north of South Korea. That, that sounds very that sounds very, is sounds very interesting. North of Iraq uh-huh. uh, is west. No, east of Lebanon. Huh. Um, <laughs> I don't oh, want to be specific, the, too specific, but uh, places, there's some yeah. places that are pretty, uh, pretty uh, heated these days. Sure. Um, well, that's yeah. the crazy so part, isn't I've it? I've got everything from hemp lines to uh, to hash lines, but I think I'm going to revisit like some Lebanese varieties, maybe some Iranian, uh-huh. um, some Turkish. I want to get back into the hash plants because I haven't hit those up for years. Uh-huh. And you put out um, a 72 Iranian. I can find out. You put out a 72 Iranian a long time ago. Is that one of yours? Or well, I didn't put it out, but there was a cutting that I gave Bodhi. It was oh. a 72 um, nice. Iranian. Basically, they called it the, uh, it was an old uh, Iranian line, this, this guy that was from Iranian descent that he had seeds of from like 72, and he germinated them in the early 80s in Los Angeles. And um, basically, they just called it another OG, and they kind of spread it around as cuttings for a long time. And they were just calling it the Iranian OG. Hmm. Um and basically, it was just from old seventy-two um, Iranian seeds, but it looks like a, an o, like an older IG, an OG, and uh, that's where Bodhi just called it. Uh, you know, he, he mixed it with one of his lines and called it ancient OG. But that's where that one came from. And I lost the cutting. A gopher got it. Right, right. I go from here. Yeah, shit. <laughs> so, like Caddyshack, he could have uh, could have went out there and fucking blew him up or something. Like, damn. Uh, well, I had a lot of plants going on, and it took my juicy fruit tie as well. So you got the Iranian and the juicy fruit tie. So he had good, uh, good, good Sucks. selection, good, good selection, taste. good, good <laughs> tasting. Good, yeah, that, go, that guy knew what's up. Um, I actually was in uh, Portland, and our buddy Sasquatch was growing some of your gear, and uh, right, we had some. Um, of the raspberry, uh, which one was it now? It was the, uh, it was the black raspberry. Black haze. raspberry, yeah. So, uh, black Bodhi raspberry put out a black haze. raspberry and I had a black raspberry that I sent out for uh, testers and Sasquatch got to grow it out before, um, mm-hmm. it really got released. So nice. it's black raspberry haze now, but yep. yeah, you got to try that out. And, and, we, uh, and I get that was nice. what you think of it. Yeah, I got to try it too. Yeah, that was nice. a good. That was a tasty one. So I mean, we tried that. We tried the, the extract too, and both. So we got to do a little. Of, got to see it all, man. You got to see the extract. Mm-hmm. I got to see the flower. Flower was a little bit still super fresh, of course, because squash just grabbed right, it. Right, right. Like, literally like a sasquatch. He just grabbed yeah. it. Rawr, ah. <laughs> no, I didn't actually do that, but it was still real fresh. So it was literally the like. Perp- the preparation that comes from that, um, it comes from the organ purple tie. So that was uh, a line breed by RC Colas, but it's a uh, organ purple tie and I think blue moonshine. That was the original um, creation of Maduro, and he did a, a breeding project up in Canada. Uh, but that the most of the colors come from the Maduro line, and it's pretty early. And then I uh, I took the Maduros and I, I did a selection of those. And then I pollinated it with um, a Neville's Haze Purple Tie F2 line that I did years ago. Um, and that male had, like, uh, resins on the ma- the male, like nice. purple resins, nice. trichomes. Yeah. yeah, pretty cool stuff. So, yeah, that's what that is. It's cool. Uh, cool. Purple Tie, Neville's Haze F3 from Mr. Nice Seed, like the first release. And then the Maduro, which is like an Oregon Purple Tie Indica uh, hybrid. Sweet. And... Uh... So is that is that something that's going to be coming out with uh, James or what seeds are now? Or is yeah, that... yeah, James should uh, begin the seeds pretty soon. Oh. So he'll, there's not a whole lot of them, but yeah, those will keep be available. An, really keep an eye out. Good. Keep an eye out for those ones because they were definitely uh, came out uh, really, really well. And that was literally, uh, I don't know how many beans he got to to work with, but I think he was uh, definitely just kind of getting them just 
straight pack. You know, it was no big, not not like some crazy, right. wasn't some crazy pheno hunt or anything like that. Um, so, so no, you, got, you shouldn't have to grow a bunch of no, a couple of seeds, and you should be able to get the nice plants from most of my lines. Right, and uh, well, with hazes in general, like if it's too much haze, then they're very they're more finicky. I guess you know, I would call it. You know, that's kind of like how they right. they tend to be. Um, whereas it's yeah, been, well, luckily yeah. this one was uh, the 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 plan I I got. It was an F three Mister Nice uh, Neville's haze from the original release. It was F three. So uh, the female that I selected was a nice candelabra style. Um, they like had bread loaves for buds, mm-hmm. you know, like long spears. Right. Um, and it was a near perfect, you know, plant. I mean, it had high, good yields. The the high was one of the top. I mean, what, it wasn't the absolute best, but it was right there at the top. And it just had this real, really nice cardamom exotic spice mm-hmm. um, aroma that was just exotic you just want to keep your you know, nose in the jar at all times gotcha. and the women loved it all the girls i gave it to it it's always hitting me up for that weed uh so it was a really nice line and then i pollinated that plant was a purple time male that bled purple um and then i revisited that line uh you know like two years ago to create uh f2s and then uh the black raspberry haze mm-hmm. so it, oh, it's ha- it's got haze in there but it's you know, it's got definitely newer um, hybrids in it, so it's not like a really hazy-looking plant. You know, you get the nice buds. Sure. You know, um, Bodie's Dreadbread, you know that one? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's good stuff. That's got, like, kind of a similar vibe as far as I grew, like, when I grew them out, I did them in the greenhouse, and uh, I just let them, they, they literally took up fucking, four of them took up the a 40 footer you know what i mean they were huge they were so but they were definitely like everything was just reaching in every direction and uh right later when i asked him he was like no no because they grow like blo- lo- loaves of bread and i was like oh that's why you call the bread and <laughs> bread and now i get it because it was like i really <laughs> they literally did they call it up like ridiculous uh yeah uh, but it was like one of those things it was right about, it was that not until I, I guess it was like december 1st here you know what i mean because so we had right there wasn't heaters on them the whole night you know and <laughs> kind of like the whole like okay i got these last four just lingering you're you know? ready for the harvest yeah yeah <laughs> but it made really Pretty good surprising uh, most of the stuff a little bit earlier good live resin you know what i mean so uh ended up being a lot of that too it was like okay well who's trimming this <laughs> that's the big question you know what I mean? so, um so with the uh, but you're pretty much a flower guy, more or less. Is that your is that your preference day to day, like daily? Sort? Yeah, I like I like flowers myself. Um, though I will be trying to um, in the near future taking some of these exotic lines and trying to make some like um, oils, pens, and stuff for people, mm-hmm. um, and maybe trying to like go back and do some like retro, you know, time consuming products. Like try to make some like sticks, mm-hmm. um, like some tie sticks, and some like maybe some like twists with some hash varieties and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, uh, on the next, you know, cycle of doing things to try to make some like really high quality oils, you know, with pens, maybe we'll do Panama red with, uh, an oil or do it with some like Acapulco golds and oils and stuff like that. So people can try to consume those. Um, I think it'll be, uh, something people will enjoy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, there's, uh, there's definitely... it's hard. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say there's definitely a, a, a big market for that. Nobody, Everybody wants to run the eight to ten week strains. Nobody wants to run a twelve to twenty two week strain. So, I think there's a really right. high end need for you know the the exotics and the land races and you know, the nostalgic older variety. So I think yeah, it, right, the nostalgia. Yeah, it's and the quality. You know, the, go ahead. I was just gonna say it's it's so hard to convince people to to do it with rooms. You know what I mean? Like it's just like so many times I've gone through facilities they'll have twelve or fourteen grow, uh, flower rooms and I'll be like. You guys could dedicate like you know four of these just to like long longer strains and put them at thirteen, eleven and kind of like concentrate them on longer longer cycles. You know what I mean? And just know that you're going to be only doing those things in there. And they're like looking at me like I'm crazy. Like, dude, that's money. You know? And I'm like, no, but what do you think's going to separate yourself from anybody else? Is like everyone's growing eight to ten week strains. You're not going to. Be, it's going to be just like everyone else. You know? It's all the same. But they don't like it. They, right, right. they don't see it that and way. They, they see it as a footprint that they're paying for, like, every day, you know. So it's very hard. Right. Well, that's where, you know, a greenhouse or be able to grow outdoors kind of will allow you to do it, you know, without spending the money 
you know, without the thousand watt light bulbs over at each plant for, yep. you know, four months. Mm-hmm. So I, I totally get it. I've, I've had guys do that, but if you, if you're able to smoke a quality or vape a quality, uh, you know, flower or a resin, I mean, there's no comparison to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you do get the quality highs, but there's just something special about, you know, a Colombian or a haze that you just don't get with an eight weeker. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just have to experience it to believe it. And, um, you know, most people will take the time to grow these plants, even if it takes, you know, as long as it takes, mm-hmm. because the high is just something special to share with friends or family. You know, it, it is really what is. it is. Well, yeah. And the little growers should be the ones who, um, who, uh, sort of see the bigger picture just because it's like, Hey, it's less clones every year. It's less, you know, less moms. If you don't have to do, you know, less cycles, less soil, less growing in and going out. So, like, I mean, it should, it should actually lend itself to like I wouldn't say the lazy grower because you don't want to say lazy, but for the guy who definitely <laughs> doesn't want to put as much input into his project every year. And if you're right. not commercially into it, it's sort of like it's a pretty expensive hobby. You know what I mean for an average person. And uh, at the end of the day, I'd rather you know I, I don't know how many times I've had it where. I grew one plant and it was fire. It was just amazing. And then I had a oh, whole yeah. other room full of shit that I didn't even want to smoke. And at the end, I was like, "Fuck! Why didn't right. I grow that? If I just grew the whole room of that, I'd have been so much better." But for some reason, you're you know you 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 even out of your own sort of uh, chase for the the something else out there, forget about that particular one because it's kind of like you know, yeah, it, it gets lost. And then those are the ones. Those are the ones you're always like. Oh. Why not? I know. Yeah, yeah. You, you, why did you keep that one plant? That shit was awesome. Or you're like, I got to get back to that plant, but I got these other projects to do. Yeah. You know, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is so it was a trade off. <laughs> right. Um, is there, uh, so you're going to be doing the Emerald Cup with us this year? Or are you going to be down there at the actual spot? or? Oh, man, I hope so. <laughs> I think I still need to get a booth right now. It's the first year I've been slacking on it, so I'm not sure I need to call up there. I just uh, had a lot of stuff this year. Um, health wise and family wise that I just need to deal with. Um, so we'll see if I can, I'm going to try to get a booth, but it may be too late. Right. Well, if you can't get a booth, you can always, uh, just chill out with us and do the ad and hang out and let James do all the work and you don't have to even have, don't have to do nothing. <laughs> let them, right. let them pull yeah, that might off not be a, a bad trade off. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> so, so with, uh, so you, so you, so you're not like a big show guy. Otherwise, like you have, you, as far as, because if you, Emerald Cups, no, I mean I'm my six months away. Emerald Cups, what I've been doing, uh, I I could be doing other shows, but my health has just not been great. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've had a lot of bad days where just it's too much work, and I'm just not healthy enough to um to to do it. I'd love to, but um, I don't got like a, a bunch of people helping me and stuff like that. So it's it's, it's almost too much for me to do mm-hmm. what I'm able to do right now. So. Well, at least you got your uh, finger on the pulse, obviously, since it's, uh, you know, if it's when you have too many people working for you, that's when things go, things go crazy. You're like, whoa, wait a minute. Somebody dropped a tray of clones. Right. What, happened, what the hell happened here? Something, something's wrong. But, uh, yeah, it's a, lot of, it's a lot more, you know, keep an eye, eye on everything. And obviously then your quality control is there, which is, is important right now for people right. getting what they want to get. So are, you have uh, any other... Uh, so besides the land race stuff, do you have any other like desire to for any other? Is there anything out there that you're looking for like besides? Um, well, like after I've done preserving on the lines, I want to do. I've been doing a lot of work that I just need to revisit. Um, I've been doing a lot of hybrids too. I mean, I've got so much work out there that it's you know um, it's it's out of control basically. But um, there's a lot of kick-ass lines I want to revisit and bring back. Um, you know, I'm getting low on stock that I need to kind of bring back. Like the Devil's Tit was one I need to get back toward the Metal Dragon. Devil's Tit is Acapulco Gold, uh, uh, Durban Poison, and uh, C99. Um, I've got the Metal Dragon, which was um, the Metal Haze F1 from um, Dutch Flowers. Mm-hmm. Pretty nice stuff that was <clears throat> pollinated with a Burmese male. So I, I got some lines that I want to bring back and... and basically make more available to people and that way it brings down the price um but the majority of the reason why there hasn't been as much out there is because i've been continuously trying to do this preservation work um which i'm now releasing you know i'm doing panama reds that are available to people now um and some colombians and some mexicans Uh, so i'm able to get those lines but it takes years to actually make these worth a shit 
Um, so the more time I have to kind of work on these lines and make them better, uh, then they'll be out to more people and I'll be able to make it cheaper. But now um, I'll be able to grow year-round continuously and I'll be able to get some lines out to people that are a lot cheaper than they were in the past. Right. And then uh, uh, with with Sonny over here, what, what, what's your next show? Since we're, we'll probably be at the same show anyway, but what, what's, our, what's, what's our next show, I should say? I don't know. The Emerald Cup, we'll see. That's it. That's, 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 that's free sailing until the yeah, Emerald Cup. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good because... Uh, well, it is August. Yeah. I mean, usually we get swamped. It is August. It is August. I know. It comes, yeah. it comes quick, that's for sure. Um, yeah, it does. So, well, we're definitely going to invite you to uh, to participate in ADSI, which is the uh, invitational that we do every year. So, if that if that's one way to get you there, that'll 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 be... Uh, Definitely, you're in. You're in our. You're in our top placing because, as we do it every year, nice. we try to we, we try to filter out obviously the so we know it's the best. And the thing is, we do no testing. It's no categories. There's no sativas, indicas. There's none of that. It's just straight up head to head. Your weed versus my weed. Then we move up to the next rank and keep moving our way up to the ranking. Oh, that sounds so, pretty cool. So yeah, it's much more. <laughs> it's much more. Um, and and everybody who's judging is the people who entered. So. At the end of the day, you have nobody to blame for yourself when, like, like Rob right. Carney, Rob Carney won with his chem uh, and last at the last one, and it had some powdery mildew in some of the buds, and every couple people complained, oh. and I was like, <laughs> "Well, you guys are the fucking judges, you know what I mean? You let it get up to that point where it actually had a chance to win. So I mean, really, you got to call out, you know, you have have to call people out. But it was like our our thought behind the idea is that we've smoked so much fucking contaminated weed over the years. That it's not about yeah, saving yeah. us, saving our, <laughs> saving our system right now. It's like, we're, and, and you're not going to bring your your B game or your C game to the to the invitational. Hopefully, you know what I mean. Hopefully, everybody brings their A game, and and they're not dipping in an avid three days before the fucking thing, going like, oh man, I hope nobody notices it. But you know, it's like, you know, you hope yeah, everybody yeah. everybody brings their best. And so, I'm not too worried about it. But it's also we don't use because the problem is everybody's now doing what they should have done a long time ago, but taking it to the extreme of going like, it's all about terps and it's all about this and we're scientifically figuring it all out. Well, it doesn't really mean, mean anything to me at the end of the day if it doesn't work. You know what I mean? Like if it's like got the most terps, but it tastes right. like, it doesn't taste good. You know what I mean? It's like, well, that doesn't, it's terpy, but it's like weird. You know what I mean? So you you can't just go by numbers, you know? So we actually have nothing. Oh, by, yeah. Nothing is done by the fucking computers or numbers or any of that. So so in that way, it's it's uh, it's more fun. But we do it all on the on the spot. That sounds too. fun. So it's all on, on the spot, and that'll be at the Emerald Cup over the two days. So, so yeah, nice. inv- you're invited yeah, yeah, to that. Yeah. So regardless if you make it, you can send it. You can send somebody, but we'd much rather have you there. Obviously, that would be way more cool. Thank you, thank you. Cool. Well, uh, I hope I'm healthy enough. I think I will be, uh, but um, I, I appreciate the offer. But uh, I, yeah, I'll be there if I can. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, we we'll definitely hope you uh, recover over these next few months and. Uh, we're gonna wind the show down anyway because I uh, I got a whole crazy amount of things to do after this show. So, uh, but yep, I gotta get to one too. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's like just taking two hours off puts <laughs> it like whoa, or three hours. Everybody's like, phone starts blowing up. But um, it was awesome to get you on the show, Snow, because we people like I said, we, you, people, people have been asking. And Sunny, three weeks of telling you you're gonna be on the show, so finally you were here. That was. See, the, our planning worked perfectly. So the, now you, yeah, it's perfect. yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll catch uh, up soon. Next week we're gonna good, have. Hey, Sonny, I'll have to catch up with you too, bro. So, so <laughs> to right, me, well, I'll talk to you too. Talk to you soon, so. All, All right, right you guys. Take care. Thank you. So peace, right, guys. You guys. Have a good day. Yep. Take care, man. Peace. Bye. Bye. You too. Bye. Two phones hanging up. Ding, 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 ding. That was good. That was a good conversation. Um, Always good. To, uh, he, it's good because Snow's got lots of connections with a lot of good land race stuff, which definitely right. and, and and it's good that he knows. You know, all the work that he's been doing uh, is finally getting recognized, which is what we wanted. That's what it's all about, right? Yep. Getting recognition and uh, also great to talk to Sonny, who's our purple man. He's like Grimace. He's like the Grimace <laughs> of our crew. He's, he's all purple. Boom. Talk to that guy. All purples. Purples. And uh, also, let's see. Next week, I think we even have. I think I even had a schedule, but now, of course, it's not sitting in front of me because me and me and uh, 
James sat in the hotel room and kind of thought about the next three weeks. I saw I think, the think we Google had Docs. Did you get the Google Docs? Yeah, I got Oh, those. good. So you yeah. got it. So, so, so we didn't even know. Like later, he's like, where is that? I go, I don't know. <laughs> like both of us are like, oh, that's funny. couldn't even like pull it up. Yeah. But uh, yeah, apparently we have a, a schedule. <laughs> Maybe we don't know at this moment, but okay. we do have a schedule. I'll we'll, be gone next week. But You'll be gone next week. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. To, good to know. Yeah. Well, it's okay. I'll get Joel up here. We'll get somebody. All right. I'll find, train somebody. Um, so t- if you're in Denver and you want to come check out the uh, So High uh, tomorrow, I've got two events going down. Uh, earlier from 4:20 to to nine o'clock, we have the Dope Magazine Mixer for their pre-party for the uh, Dope Cup, which is going on here in Colorado on Sunday. It's a one-day event. Uh, it's RSVP event, so you don't even need to pay nothing. You just need to check out um, Dope Magazine and. Um, either on their Facebook page, I'm pretty sure it'd be easy, pretty easy to find. Uh, don't have it in front of me, but I'm sure it'll be easy to find. And then check out the the, the pre party, which will be here at Soho Gallery. And if you come through and you tell them Adam done a show, I'm sure they'll, they'll let you in because it's not it's not like one of them parties. And then the, after that, directly after that at nine o'clock, is the Bongathon post party. So, so we got a pre party and a post party going on. No actual parties here, bro. It's just not, not, not real parties. These are just <laughs> pre and post parties. Uh, and that's going to be from nine till midnight, one o'clock, whatever, until the beer runs out because they're bringing all their kegs they never got to at the thing and they're going to kind of hang out and probably do some uh, fastest grams, I'm sure, will go down and it'll be it'll be cool. So if you're in town you want to check out the Bongathon crew, uh, they will be here Saturday, tomorrow. Here at the So High Gallery, 2209 Welton Street, here in Denver. Uh, okay, I want to do a big uh, shout out to all the, let's give a big shout out to all of our sponsors. Uh, New Millennium, Build a Soil, Incredibles, and Seeds Here Now, of course. Um, oh, yeah. If you don't have to pull up all the things, it's fine. I, I got it. I remember there's only four now. We're going nice. to have more, though. We're gonna have, we, have a, we have one on the wings, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, wow himself. Ron Wallace, who's going to be on the show in... I probably have him on the show a bunch of times, but he's also going to jump on the sponsorship program uh, starting immediately. I didn't get him this month, mm-hmm. this week, but definitely uh, probably by next week we'll have him on here. And uh, Very nice. He is cranking away with his record attempt, again, as usual, pumpkins. And his whole... And I got all the other... There's a, there's a lot of pumpkin action going on. Dude. Let me tell you, wow. pumpkin action is getting serious. It's getting Crazy. fierce. So we're gonna have him on. Little updates here and there. Uh, hopefully not jinx him. Hopefully he'll. Uh, I don't know. I don't think he's gonna win this year. Unfortunately, because there's some serious competition. He said from Europe, these guys are going nuts. <laughs> they got greenhouses built around their fucking pumpkins and shit. So it's like, whoa, these got greenhouses. I'm like, oh my god. I can see it's already like just like kind of weed war style thing. Yeah, like, totally. Anyway, so Mr. Ron Wallace will be joining us as a sponsor. Wow. Look, you can look up his formula. It's W-O-W, Wow Nutrients Line. It's actually a pretty awesome thing. We'll get the whole, we'll get all the, all the details next week. And uh, big shout-out to Ace, who's picking up Little Nick, I think, right now. They should already be picked up. Headed down to the farm. And uh, big shout-out to Andy and Tim and Murray down at the farm. Shout out to uh, all the listeners and all the chat, chat gang. gang. Chat gang. And we'll uh, give you an update pre more than a day ahead. I'm gonna because now we actually have a list, and I think uh, he supposedly has a Google Doc. So if he has a Google Doc, that means he may even be able to find out somehow magically what we even have, <laughs> and then we'll update it before the show. So thank you guys for listening. Talk to you soon. Peace. Being played on every radio station in the United States is a communication to the children to take a trip, to cop out, to groove. The psychedelic jackets on the record albums have their own we don't want you to smoke genetically modified ganja. We want you to smoke the real thing. We want you to smoke the natural herb. Some call it marijuana. Some call it sensimedia. Some call it lamb's bread. And some people call it 